Yes. And I call the meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. Um, a few words about meeting logistics. Uh, anyone who's joining remotely, please uh, set your first, your display name is for your first and last name. Um, anyone who uh, addresses the council, please start by saying who you are and where you live. And we ask that you keep your comments, whatever they are, to under three minutes. If you're speaking about a specific agenda item, please keep your comments germane to the topic. Anyone who wishes to be recognized must be re wishes to speak must be recognized by the mayor. And again, keep your comments to the topic at which you're addressing. And uh, if you go beyond the time limit or go beyond the topic under discussion, you may be asked to uh, maybe interrupted. Um, I'll also mention that uh, around 8.30, depending on what's going on, we will we'll have probably a 10 minute break. And that's the general practice for all of our meetings. And uh, away we go. Start out by uh, asking the uh, members if we could approve the agenda. Everybody happy with the agenda? Donna. I would like to add an item that is the intention is to not apply any late fee to the late property tax payments of those eight houses that our planning department declared as substantially damaged by the flood. And they're the ones who have to comply or demolish their homes. So I would like to add that. Okay, should we add that under other business? Great. Okay. So there is a point of order that y'all's mics are going into the Zoom, but they're not going into the room. And so unless if everybody can speak up, I don't know any other solution for those of us in the room this far back. Um, thank, thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good point. And, uh, you know, this is our second meeting in this room. Uh, we're going to see if we can get uh, some house sound for uh, future meetings because people are entitled to be able to hear. <laughs> the timing was just perfect, wasn't it? We're assuming this is how the school board operates. Yeah. We have a hard time hearing one another. Okay. Did a motion to approve the agenda with the modification that Donna approved? Or? Yeah. I think we just, we just accept it. it. Yeah. Okay. So move. Yeah. No, we, just, we don't need a motion. We just say oh, okay. everyone's happy with it. We're, we're moving forward. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any person to uh, <coughs> address the council on any item that is not on the agenda. And again, it's. Uh, Three minute limit, and Councillor Bate will uh, assist us with uh, keeping track of time. Steve. This way, speak from for the Zoom, benefit of the Zoom. Uh, Steve Whitaker, um, I'd like to raise a couple issues until my time runs out. Um, I've spoken to quite a few people and have walked the streets both during the flood, after the flood days after the flood and in recent weeks. And the amount of silt, toxic silt that we know contains feces and chemicals and oil residue that is blowing around, it's very uh, irritant. And unfortunately, even more corrosive is what the reaction I'm getting from the folks who express concern of it. They have no faith that it's worth their time to tell council about it. They have no faith that y'all will do anything about it. And to me, that's more corrosive because that discourages participation in all the other issues that are of vital importance. So I want to raise both of those red flags. Years ago, I recommended a, a vacuum cleaner that uh, Steve Everett had seen in Europe that could have been purchased for the price of the dysfunctional sweet sweep, street sweeper we have. And it's, it's really not right to put a public event on Elm, 
on uh, Langdon this weekend, when you go and look at the bridges and they still have a quarter inch of silt, you look under our benches and there's a half inch of silt. You look up and down the railway and it, 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 we still have a toxic environment even if we become inured to it. And we don't have a system to clean up Confluence Park, the, the bike path, the handicap ramp out of the transit center. It's real serious. I, I, in the interest of time, I may petition for an agenda item on that at a future meeting. But uh, secondly, the proposed Blue Ribbon Council, I think it's imperative that the makeup of that council be fresh, non-biased, and be wide open to both future ideas and criticism of the current response. That will not occur if our city manager is an installed member there. I think the council should uh, decline permission for that to be the case. That council was not convened by this council. Uh, it was created by Montpelier Alive and the uh, foundation. And they don't get to do something like that when you're in charge, okay? They don't get to decide who's gonna put their foot or exp I, I don't deny that Bill has deep experience and long, maybe too long a history here, but we can't allow it to potentially sabotage or put a foot on the scale of this opportunity to really get some fresh ideas and, and a fair assessment of uh, the Good Samaritan shelter, a congregate shelter in the remains of a uh, pandemic is a really bad idea. It's dangerous, it's ludicrous to consider a, pe a congregate shelter at the Elks Club. Those bathroom facilities, shower facilities could be used if they're there. Uh, I'm not sure they are. Um, but smaller huts spread out across the land and people have to walk to a bathroom is fine and safe. People have secure storage for their personal effects. They can have restrooms. We can get some huts Conestoga huts are a thousand bucks. We could even create more of, of them or the platforms for them for other sections of the state and help get some gainful employment for the folks that are gonna house up there. So I, I know I'm out of time, but those are valuable ideas that we need to put a priority on. Okay, thank you. Yep. And, and I'll just mention for your benefit and the benefit of the public, the uh, city is represented on this commission by the city council president and uh, although we do anticipate that the city manager and other city officials will Present. maintain uh, a liaison role but not as a voting member and the, and the city manager was very clear that uh, he believed that it should be a elected official not uh, staff on that commission thank you i missed that memo okay all right Next, any other <coughs> members of the public under general business and appearances? I'm not seeing anyone in-house, and I'm not seeing anyone online with their hands raised. Okay, we can move on to the consent agenda. Um, there's a request to re remove item I from the consent agenda for further discussion. Um, any requests for take anything else off the consent agenda? Okay, uh, I would entertain a motion to adopt the consent agenda. So moved uh, with the consent agenda minus item I. Second. All right, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All right. Anyone opposed? Okay. Thank you. Item I. Uh, Councillor Heaney wanted to take this off the consent agenda, and and could we have a little explanation of what this is? You know, this is one of those things where. Uh, we need to see if the finance director is here. Uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, so this is an issue of this is an annual, while she's coming out, this is an annual, basically we have some funds that need to be carried forward from one year to another and they're just assigning them to be put into, it's kind of a ministerial thing that we have to do every year uh, just to make sure that the funds that need to be put in special funds do and don't get all swept out into someplace else. So, but 
I will let someone brighter than me explain that. Uh, yeah, so as Bill said, um, per our fund balance policy annually, um, this is presented to you all. Usually it's in June. This oh, year I waited sorry. because I felt it was more prudent to have the complete numbers to then have you do this instead of have it fluctuate. Um, and then this will be used for the audit preparation. But <clears throat> funds that are restricted or non-spendable or committed by council are included in this list. Um, some of them are dictated by grant agreement or statute or governmental accounting rules. And some of them are items you've chosen to commit and continue to commit based on changes year after year. So that's what makes up this list. Everything that's not on this list um, falls into the unassigned bucket. So that, that's what this is doing. Um, it's just a formality in line with the fund balance policy that shows what is non-spendable, restricted, committed, and assigned. So this is income from fiscal year 2023 that we're shifting from the 2023 budget to our reserves? So this um, encompasses fund balance from prior years as well as changes that happened during fiscal year 23 that impacted each of those numbers. So just trying to understand this because I'm new. So are these like re reserve funds that just weren't used and they're just moved to forward? So Correct. basically if we're trying to put 15% aside a year, we spend the goal, but it does accumulate for different funds. There are, yeah, there are other purposes that accumulate fund balance. So our goal is to have 15% um, in unassigned for you know shortfalls or unanticipated events, but we also carry other fund balance that has specific purposes or that we have assigned or you as council has assigned um, for specific purposes. So, and then the reserve funds just, so it's basically any unexpended reserve funds do shift just into the general budget, is it? No, so for example, say, I, I'm, this is a for instance, it's not a specific, you know, say the council has set $50,000 in reserve for fixing park trails, just make that up. So over the years we spent 10, 15, so now there's like 23,000 left. You were just, you're just making a motion to move that, to keep that reserved for that purpose. Okay. So that it's carrying forward, so there's a record that it doesn't, at the end of the fiscal year, without the council saying, we intend to reserve this money or keep it assigned, mm -hmm. it would go into the general fund. So you, you have to intentionally choose to keep those reserve, those items that were set aside for certain purposes. And a few years ago, you know, probably more than a few now. We, we went through and culled through them and got rid of a bunch of them. And we do that every year now is to, you know, see if there's any we'd recommend getting rid of. But most of these are active. And so that's, it's, but it does, you know, the auditors are going to say, what's your basis, Sarah and Bill, for holding this money? We say, because the council voted on it to keep these in reserve. The other question I had is, because there's so much material and trying to absorb it all, is the, um, so for the reserve, the goal is 15%. We're going into a year coming up that's obviously very challenging for budget. So we're not obliged to 15% now, right? We'll have, nope. I mean, hopefully no, we goal, can set that aside in the budget, but if right. it's really bad, maybe so we can. We don't budget for, for the fund balance. It's just our goal is to get have it, okay. when we get to it, is to try to have that much reserve. And the, the reason for the policy was that was, that was what was considered a good, safe amount. And then the reason was once we hit 15%, if we were to exceed it, then the council could have a conversation what to do with the excess. Should that be spent on a specific project or reduce taxes or you know whatever? But the idea was once we get beyond 15, then that becomes fair game. So we were pretty close to it last year, but we're going to drop down this year. But our goal ultimately is that that's the safe amount that we should have. That's the recommended amount by auditors, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, how can we adjust these numbers once they're rolled over? Can we can we adjust them? What do you mean? After if we if we uh, reserve them for the upcoming budget, can we uh, alter them at all later? I believe in so. the budgeting process. Um, the items in here that are <clears throat> up to you that are not restricted by grants or statute. Um, yeah. At any time, you can make a decision to spend that money or allocate it to something else. Okay, and then all of the others are restricted somehow. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if we got a grant from the federal government that says it has to be used for <clears throat> fixing the city hall after the flood, 
that's the only thing we could use that for. Yep, so if we hadn't spent all that money during FY23, then a portion of that would be restricted for the future and would only be able to use on City Hall. So you, then you would see expenses in that next year that didn't appear to be budgeted for, but were coming out of the reserve. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Pella, did you have your hand up? Okay. Everybody happy. Great, I, I think it's always good to raise these questions so that we all understand what we're voting on. So, is there a motion to uh, pass item I? I Donna, second. <clears throat> Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we've adopted item I of the consent agenda and we are now up to appointment to the homelessness task force. And we have one application, uh, Meredith Warner. Is Meredith Warner here? Yeah, oh, great. Oh, Meredith. Hi, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself to us? Hi, sure, yeah. My name's Meredith Warner. I'm a Montpelier resident. I'm also an employee at Good Samaritan Haven. I do um, fundraising and development there. I've been attending um, the homelessness task force meetings uh, just to kind of pay attention to what's going on and was alerted to the need for another member and felt like I could make the time to do it and I have a vested interest. Anybody have any questions for Meredith? Okay. Is there a motion? Could I comment on the task force? Um, no, no, no. It's not really what we're here for. I know you may have concerns about the task force, but this is specifically the appointment of this applicant. I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve her appointment. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to appoint Meredith Warner to the homelessness task force. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, Meredith, thank you for uh, coming forward to do that. You're welcome, thanks for having me. And of course, you're free to stay on. Oh. <laughs> we always tell people they're free to stay on beyond the, uh, their item, and they usually <laughs> blink off pretty quick. Can't blame them. Okay, that brings us to item seven, Encampment at Gateway Park. This is an item that was uh, put on a request of Linda Berger. So Linda, why don't you come on up? Hi, I live in District One. I'm also a Green Mount Cemetery Commissioner. Um, the Montpelier policy on camping is that nothing in the policy is intended to permit or allow individuals to camp on publicly owned property um, it's to, um, within boundaries of the city only in emergency situations where individuals without other resources have been left with no other options for camping. City intervention includes encampments are determined to be in high sensitivity areas or environmental protection factors will be subject to intervention and asked to move or re relocate given their potential degradation to the environment. Key points regarding Gateway Park. Gateway Park is a small pocket park. Most of the land, except for the park parking lot with the rocks around it, is owned by the state. The cemetery owns the parking lot. Years ago, the cemetery received a transportation grant to transform this area into Gateway Park. As part of the grant, the cemetery is responsible for maintaining this area and has been involved in mowing, debris removal, the mural project, as well as graffiti, graffiti removal from the state underpass structures. The park is touted by the city as being located at the western gateway to Montpelier. It sits on the edge of the Winooski River. Um, it includes trees, places to sit, parking, a bike rack, river access, and a canoe launch. In the 2017 Montpelier Master Plan, the city's biodiversity conservation areas it is listed as part of Site M, the western corner floodplain, with floodplain forest and underdeveloped floodplain. Health and safety concerns. Currently, the land on which there are campers contains toxic silt, 
contaminated soil, and dust from the flooding. There are piles of rock and dirt near the tents from sewer construction at the cemetery. The tents are literally in the Vermont AOT heavy duty construction area, so it's dangerous. The encampment at Gateway. The campers have been camping, campers have been camping at Gateway since July 2023. Specific campers at Gateway have de declined the cemetery's offer, dated 919, to use a safe section of the cemetery with water, trash, and a portalette, if the city council approves this. The campers declined because once the snow um, closed the roads in the cemetery, they would have to re relocate, and they planned on camping all winter. Thus, bring, this brings into question if this encampment is, in fact, an emergency shelter. Campers initially stated that they would stay that they would stay where they are at Gateway Park without clean water or trash, and that they have a bucket to use as a toilet for when the state's portalette is removed. To reiterate, this camp encampment is semi-permanent. Their initial plan was the river would be their septic system and the fragi fragile vegetation on the bank would be possibly disturbed. Recently, the campers stated they are planning to rent a portalette, keep it locked, and remain at Gateway Park without water or trash facilities. State statutes. This is state land. State statutes on use of property. It's VS 19 VSA 106 highways. Overnight camping. A person shall not use any part of a public highway right of way, a public, public rest area associated with a public highway, or any public land not so designated by the agency, department, or municipality, having control of same as an overnight camping area for the purpose of overnight camping. A person who violates this section shall be fined not more than $50 for each day that he or she is in violation. There's other kinds of camping that the state allows. There's state primitive camping. There's use of fish and wildlife lands. There's, um, but there, uh, there um, are no fish and wildlife um, sites in the Montpelier or Washington County area near us. So, um, and it's interesting, I looked in the statutes, I don't think the state has addressed emergency um, shelter in, par in camps yet. I, I couldn't find that. So once again, the cities are trying to lead on dealing with a significant problem for people. And anyway, questions about the policy of the city. My questions are, should the city revisit that all parks are considered highly sensitive areas? Literally, as I read the policy, if I needed a place to camp, I don't know where I would go. I have some potential alternative park at, park at parks for encampments that are fully accessible and are not in environmentally sensitive areas. There's Mill Pond Park, there's Harrison Preserve, there's Summer Street Park, there's City Hall Plaza. There's also potential alternative sites within designated areas, Redstone. We could utilize specific non-sensitive areas in Hubbard Park or North Branch Park. Should Montpelier compile a map or list of public properties to utilize for emergency camping? Questions about the illegal encampment at Gateway Park. What was the city intervention? Was the, was the city of Montpelier encampment response form completed? What were the findings and actions for both tents? There's now another tent there. Who supervises the actions of the peer support outreach worker in a reported case? There seems to be no process for public reporting and feedback to the public. There is no time frame or flow chart for responding to public referrals and recourse for perceived inaction or perceived inappropriate response. This is, um, the form is on page 13. Why is there a lack of specificity in de definition of emergency shelter and sleeping? What's a reasonable time frame for the city and for campers? When does an emergency become an entitlement, either by the campers or by the peer support outreach worker? Page nine of the policy. Possible interventions within a 24-hour time frame. GMC offered, at the cemetery offered space on 9-19-23. Is the police involved in organizing a response as indicated on page eight? And camping in cars is, is not addressed in this policy. So the problem, as I see it, is there's illegal camping at Gateway Park. It was recognized in the policy that it's a, that it's a sensitive area. It's when it's not, unfortunately, really devastated by the flood and by construction, people use that tiny pocket park to sit, look at the river, go walk in the river, go fishing, launch their canoes. Given the status of the riverbed at this point, I don't know that they'll be able to launch canoes for a while. 
So um, that's my concern. Um, okay. I don't know how the city can condone um, violating a state statute. Thanks, Linda. Now I've got two questions, and um, they're, they may come across as being um, aggressive, but it's really just trying to explore uh, your thinking. And, and the questions are, one, what harm do you believe that the two people there are doing? And two, what would you request that the city do? The, I didn't, st I think there's more of a harm done to them. That soil is toxic, as Steve Whitaker had indicated. It's that gray, toxic soil. I went there the other day and it closed off my throat and my lungs. It's exactly the stuff, the silt that we had after the flood. Um, so, I, and as a human being, I wouldn't want to live or have people live in a construction zone. So I genuinely feel first the harm is done to the people that are there. I think the city can do better. It's a, it's, it should be ashamed of itself. And there's other parks in the city or other, I don't know what the public properties are in the city. Um, I, I've never seen a map, I don't know a list, but there must be places. And I listed a few of the par parks that seemed to me from just briefly looking at them had potential for having safe, respectful camping sites. So that was, and that's the answer to the first question. And the second question, I'm sorry. The second question is really, what are you asking the city to do? Like, do you want the to police or somebody to, to go I, and either arrest these people or move them off the land? I don't know if the city has looked at the forms from the outreach workers. I don't know what has been done. I'm assuming the city is looking, but now there's another tent there. And you know, I let you know that it's not a, that it's in violation of state statutes. So if the city of Montpelier wants to be in violation of a state statute, I, I think that's an interesting position for the city to be in. Okay, um, I'll, I'll mention to people that I went over there at lunchtime today to talk to the uh, people who were staying there, and I talked to the gentleman whose name I didn't catch, unfortunately, who's who's staying there, and he said they were not going to be able to be to to get over here for the meeting tonight. But uh, it's very, very, actually very neat and uh, nice place to be given the limitations of living outdoors. Um, and he specifically said he w they wanted to be where they are uh, separate from other homeless enc encampments. But Bill, do you have anything to follow up? Um, I would say that we try to follow the policy as best we can. You know, we have seen an uptick in, in unhoused folks over the last few years and try to uh, make evaluations as to how the city responds based on the disruption that a group is causing, the location, those types of things. We don't want to make a police response as our first response. We don't think that's appropriate. And uh, they don't want to get in the middle of it. Um, you know, I, I th it's a technical issue, but uh, to the extent there's a violation of state statute. It's not the city that's violating state law. It's the, the people who are on Cape, you know, the city isn't committing any any violation. The, if if there's a violation, it's these people are, are doing that. The state, to our knowledge, has not asked us to do anything nor chosen to do anything. Um, so, you know, I, I get it. I mean, it's, it's a tough situation, but uh, so our interpretation of shelter was that there is adequate rooms in shelters for people. And it was specifically talked about, you could be on a city land unless there was a place to go for a shelter. And um, while there may on any given night be a room or two available for shelter, uh, there's certainly far more people than a room or two that are out. And um, you know, I think people have been camping in certain parts on city ground. I think in the, perhaps the more wooded areas of Harvard Park, folks have been. I think the cemetery has offered its space. Uh, people have camped up at the former country club. Um, so there are areas of city land that we have uh, made determinations that no one was being harmed, that, that it was a situation now, you know, Linda raises a good point about the potential harm to the individuals. And I don't know, I don't, we haven't really thought of it from that perspective before in terms of um, 
what our responsibility is to them as far as you know it being an unsafe area um, and that's concern and in the area of the cemetery that we've used for for campers before it was not touched by the flood waters it's near the portola it's near um, water it's near the trash and it's a safe area two different sets of campers have used that space it's also supervised you know as much as the work day um, okay. Any comments from members of the council and, and one more thing the campers have been incredibly respectful of the land that where they are it's just they've been model campers in a really unsafe setting I see hands in the in the uh, public. I'll start with members of the council. I think there are a bunch of people, and I'm not sure whose hand is up first. So, start down at your end with Donna. Uh, well, when I was visiting them, there was just one tent there. There's two tonight. Uh, tonight, okay, but and they were only planning to stay until it got colder. They weren't planning to stay all year. Did they tell you they were? They had a conversation with um, okay. the cemetery director. Yeah, and it's very, very pleasant. And yeah. yeah. So I, I see it as an issue. Okay. So a couple things I want to clarify that this is state land that they're on. Yes, they are right? state land. So, I mean, I think that Bill addressed this, but this, doesn't, this isn't a city. Our city policy doesn't apply here. We don't actually have the authority to make people leave off state land. Um, or set, tell them they can stay, is my understanding. It's, it's kind of a non-issue. It's, it's up to the state. As, am I right about this? I, think, I Generally, yes. I think there is a, definitely a fine line between uh, if somebody were breaking into a state building at night and our police were apprehending yeah, yeah, yeah. them, but or if somebody was committing a violation on the state house lawn, we could we could remove them from the situation. But that would be in response to an action, not just being there. Right. And I think perhaps I, I don't want to speak for police or anybody else because I don't know for sure the answer. But it's possible that if the if the state called us and asked us to ask on their behalf, then that might be different. But in terms of just us having authority over state property, we don't. Okay, great. And I wanted to say that I did not know that the cemetery had offered space, which is fantastic. And um, and I, I'm, I want to kind of like pin that to talk about ways to make that workable for people. If it doesn't, it sounds like it doesn't work for these particular folks, but if there's some way to, and if you're, that's fantastic, that'd be great. I believe that Patrick even offered to help transport their camping gear up yeah. to the site. Yeah. And then the final thing is um, they don't want to move, and, <laughs> and that, you know, part of what we, part of what I think is built into our policy and where a value that I think is important for us always to act on is respect for people's autonomy and for their ability to make individual decisions and, and you know, have, have control over their own lives. And so if they're not feeling like it's a health risk, and I would say that it is open for debate whether the silt on the ground is a health risk. Um, I'm not saying it's not, but I'm saying it's open, um, then I'm not comfortable with going in and saying, we think it's not safe for you, so we're making you leave off of this land that doesn't belong to us, that we don't have any authority over. So um, I'm happy just to let them stay, and that's the best place that they, they've decided they want to be. So, uh, Linda, do they know that they're on state land? I take it they don't know they're on state land. They think I they're don't on. Know what I don't know what our we see someone nodding. I think they apparently they do. <laughs> they do know, um, and the and and you'll get a chance to, to tell us about that. And the the site that you offered them, their objection was had to do with se seasonal win uh, that, snowfall. That's my under. I, I didn't have the conversation. Patrick, our director, Patrick, um, conveyed that information that. Access they, would be difficult, or that they wanted that we don't plow the roads in the cemetery in the winter. Most of the roads there's just the lower level mm -hmm. roads, so it wouldn't be as accessible. Was my understanding was the concern. Also, to answer your question, Sal, the place they're on right now is totally flat, yeah. and yeah. these are people with some 
mobility issues. So mm -hmm. having to climb up into the hills of the cemetery mm -hmm. would probably be a real problem for them. Mm -hmm. It's not way up in the hills of the okay. cemetery. It's right near the garage, this gotcha. section. Okay. <clears throat> and I don't want to cut you off. If yeah, you no, more, so. and I'm just curious about, um, I mean, there's no there's no heating. How what, what is the what is the plan for the winter? I, I don't know what their plan is. For, that's yeah. not my. I can, I can tell you what they told me. <laughs> yeah. The, the new done? the new tent that's appeared is the tent that they brought in. That's intended for winter camping, and they're going to be getting uh, they're bringing a heater in, a catalytic heater or something. I'm not certain. BTU heater. Okay. Hmm. You know, I'm gonna. I know there are other people who want to talk, but I'm going to call on you right now because it sounds like you're uh, you're knowledgeable. I'm the one living there. Okay, I'm, I'm one of the two living there. Well, why don't you come up to the please, come to up. the table please. so you can be I've picked up on the a, microphone? My name is Tammy Menard. My husband Lucas and I have been out there since the end of July. I have to have two knee replacements. Um, we have talked to Patrick about the site that was proposed to us up behind the cemetery. <clears throat> Patrick has told us that the site that's there, they plow the main road to the um, main building. This site actually is up the hill and further back, um, probably another 500 feet or so, uphill. Mm -hmm. I cannot get in there during the winter. The reason we are, have chosen Gateway Park is because it is flat and because it has a physical address where my ride can pick us up to come to town. Yeah. Um, we are in the process of getting a winter tent, which arrived yesterday. So the two tents that are currently there and the new one that came yesterday. Uh, the smaller tent will be taken down and stored. The bigger tent that we've been sleeping in is going to put all of our uh, uh, totes and storage stuff in. So there will be two tents there. We are planning on tarping off our tent and heating it with a BTU, uh, a buddy heater which throws off some good heat to keep us warm. It is not the first winter we've spent out at Gateway Park. Usually we have a vehicle. However, we lost our vehicle a couple years ago and have not been able to replace it. So, um, and as for health, and health issues, we are checking into getting a compost toilet but we had to buy the tent first, so we will be getting a compost toilet. As of right now, we are using a bucket. It is being emptied in the porta potty that is out there at the moment. When the porta potty leaves, we have two outlets here in town where we can, we'll, we'll, where we will be able to empty that bucket until the compost bucket gets there. Um, trash is taken out once or twice a week. Whenever the bag gets full, it usually goes out. And I, I'm sorry, Mayor, when you were out there this afternoon, I was doing laundry, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if there's any questions, we will be more than willing to sit down with anybody and do whatever we can to rectify this. We've um, noticed while we've been there, the amount of traffic in the parking lot doing illegal things has slowed down quite a bit. Um, and there's been no new graffiti out there. We've, we've chased the kids that had cans in their hands walking across the grass to go do it out of there just by coming out of the camp because the dog alerted us to people there. Mm -hmm. um, we're not disrespectful in any way, shape, or form to anybody out there. We try to keep the 
the area clean, neat, and well kept. There is an extra tent right there, out there at the moment, but we're in the process of moving down one tree length away from the parking lot, so there's not so much dust. Um, we're gonna reseed and rake up where we were. So I don't know what else I can do or either one of us could do. We have no place in town to be. We have one social security check a month for two of us to live on. And I'll, sorry, $900 just doesn't go very far with two yep. people. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you came here because I was, I, I was disappointed that you, you weren't gonna be able to be here. So thanks for coming. Well, this it was great. last minute, find a ride. He said, mm -hmm. oh yeah, I can get you there. So yeah. Great. I, can I just? Yeah. Has anyone with a state decal on their car stopped by to say hi? No, At sir, not that, that I'm done? aware of. So you, the state doesn't know you're there? I'm sure the state knows we're there. You think they know you're I am there. sure they know you're we're sure. there because state vehicles go by there all the time on that mm -hmm. highway and on the route too. Okay. So I am absolutely sure that the state knows we're there. Thanks. Any, anything else going down this way from any other? Lauren, do you have anything? I guess just uh, the way our policy is written. So when the Elks Club shelter opens, does that trigger any different implementation of our policy? If there technically, so technically wasn't technically, if there's a room, if there's a room available, someone's you know we don't have to leave them on city land. Um, you know the way it's been the last year or so, there's just been so many more people and there are rooms available. Even if there's, you know, a room for one person in a night, you know, it's like, which one gets, you know, I, I, we've been trying to be as humane about it as possible and looked at, you know, how people are treating their situations and what other disruptions are involved or are they, are they in more sensitive areas? So uh, that's how we've been interpreting the policy. Uh, and, I, you know, I see Rick wants to speak too toward that, but, um, I mean, there's only going to be, Rick will tell you for sure, but I want to, I think, you know, up to 15 beds. It's not like yeah. we're going to be able to house everybody mm -hmm. uh, all winter. Yes. Uh, do you have anything? <laughs> okay, uh, Tammy. Um, at, as for the shelter being, I believe, out by the Elks Club, uh, out by the old uh, golf course, mm -hmm. my understanding, and I know it's an issue for us, uh, is there's no transportation to it. There's no city bus that goes out there, and I'm hearing there's no other way to get out there. I cannot walk it. I had all I could do to walk in from the car to here today. Um, I have to have two knee replacements done, and I have to be on flat ground. Mm -hmm. My husband has a psychological disability. He can't be around a lot of people. We can't be in a shelter. Gotcha. And he has a letter stating from his doctor he cannot be in a shelter. We tried doing the Good Samaritan Haven shelter in Barrie four years ago, I think it was. It didn't work out very well. Not that we were thrown out. It's just he had a hard time being around that many people. Mm -hmm. um, I do check regularly to see if we can get into a motel, but there's a waiting list. Or we have to go all the way down st down southern part of the state when all of our doctors are here. So this is where you need to be. So this is the only alternative we have. <sighs> We're trying not to be in town, sleeping in doorways, or around all the people that are drinking because we're not big drinkers. Um, they're, we just don't want to be around troublemakers. We just like to keep to ourselves. And you know we go into town, clean up, Three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we take showers. We come, we have friends that are giving us place to shower, and we wash up three or four times a week ourselves. If you know, there's no hygiene issue. We have places to get water. Right now, Patrick at the cemetery has told us we could fill our water jugs off of one of the spigots. When that shuts down in October, we have places in town to fill our water. So 
You're doing a wonderful job. We are are trying to be self-sufficient. We we don't use a lot of the agencies. All of our equipment is bought by us. So, you know, we're doing the best we can, trying to survive. Yep, I totally get that. Thank you, Zach. I'm going to try to speak up. I think it's uh, easier. Yeah. Um, Zach Hughes, Mom Pillier, and I want to answer the questions uh, laid out by Linda. As I think, um, look at the policy. You'll see the form there. I'm not really. We. I don't. Um, I'm part of the vol- I'm the volunteer part of this mm-hmm. response. Uh, Don Little does the uh, GSA GM, uh, Good Samaritan side, and we have quite a good network. We communicate constantly around this stuff. We communicate with city staff. So we were aware of Gateway. Um, Our system is not very popular, but what we tend to do is we give a 24 hour um, note to the person and say, uh, we'd like you to sleep. You can't sleep here. Here's here's a number for you to call um, so we can help you find another spot. Um, That is generally how we respond um and i i think this beg i mean we can't do it here tonight but i think at some point we're gonna have to have a discussion about the land inside the public land Mm -hmm. i i didn't really want to come here because i've been trying to do it offline but it's been very difficult to do that to try to talk about this even in committee because we keep getting told there's just nothing there um, what I'm talking about is I've watched two Ninth Circuit rulings out of the West Coast, which aren't applicable here necessarily, but are concerning to me because they're public, it's public land. So the issue of being told this area is off limits, this area is off limits, where can people go? Where can I send the, somebody? Where can I offer to send someone? And telling me this area is sensitive is just not going to work very much longer without me raising this concern. And I didn't want to do it here, um, but I feel like Linda bringing this up was an opportune time because, unfortunately, this isn't going away. Um, And we know. And I've seen, let's see, there's a second ruling out of the Ninth Circuit. That's the same thing as the first one with a little more narrowness. So I, I raise a concern. We continue to coordinate with the city, but again, I feel I think the city's feeling like there's nowhere out there. Um, so what happens is we get these parks. Oh, we got someone in the park. Let's move them along. That's not okay. Um, we need to find spots. And before you ask me where, I don't know where. But that's not my job because I don't own that land, That's right. mm-hmm. okay? So I want to put you all on notice that I am monitoring, and I will speak up again if I have to. Thank you very much, and I will yield for questions. Thanks, Zach. Uh, Rick. Yeah, thanks, Rick DeAngelis, uh, Montpelier resident, and also the director or co-director of Good Samaritan Haven. You know, I, I have to say I'm I'm just so moved by the remarks tonight, the respectful remarks, both from Linda and also from Tammy, it um, I, it just illustrates the, the complexity of this problem, how vexing it is, and, and how we're all trying to do the right thing, but yet it's still very, very difficult. So thank you, guys. And Tammy, if there's anything that we can do to help, you know, just reach out to Dawn, and we will do our best to assist you. Uh, I've got a couple of comments. I'll try to keep it very brief. Uh, You know, the numbers of this problem that we have right now with homelessness is like nothing we've ever seen before in Vermont. I've been working here for over 30 years in housing. It's really, really bad. The shelters are full right now, and uh, the motels are essentially full. Uh, We've got 60 to 70 people living outside in our, our area, Washington County. So... And there are people, and we have been struggling 
all summer long to find good places for people to direct them where to camp. And the most difficult places to find the type are places that kind of places that Tammy described where you can drive in, that there's good access. And um, so it's understandable why they're there. Um, uh, I also wanted to make a comment about the state law. You know, there are folks all over the state camping on state property, and, including pull-offs. And in fact, we had some involvement. You may be aware that there's a little picnic camping area we're outside, right outside of Waterbury on Route 2. You may have seen it before. Uh, and there is a group that's been camping there uh, all summer. And we had some involvement with them. And uh, we did coordinate with the governor's office. And they basically said that they have a hands-off policy unless there's a real egregious problem. So they understand and they're trying to allow people as much flexibility as possible to find the, the best shelter that they can. Um, Steve. <clears throat> Steve Whitaker, uh, you may recall that when I first uh, prevailed uh, and pleaded with y'all to create the homelessness task force that the priorities were hygiene, toilets, showers, designated camping areas, phone charging, uh, and we haven't accomplished any of those, and it's been, what, four years now? So I want to remind you of how inept our response has been to creating designated camping areas. I commend how what I've heard tonight from all parties, um, and I also recognize the concern. It, it's it's uh, admirable that you're looking out for your perception of the health of the of the folks that may not have the wherewithal to understand or assess the risk. Um, I feel the risk. I wouldn't camp there. Um, but could we cap the silt that surrounds this area? Could we put uh, a toilet trailer that gets pumped out or a shower trailer that gets pumped out in some of these designated areas? Maybe not there. But I originally identified Peace Park on the opposite side of the river. But you'd need like a golf cart or something to get people to town. I don't know why we don't prevail upon my ride to you know, or Green Mountain Transit to do a golf cart. You know, we got, we give them that transit center for a dollar a year. They don't even keep the bathrooms open. Okay? That's gross neglect of city management to not enforce that lease and keep those bathrooms open. The city should use some of its 450000 to keep those bathrooms open around the clock. But Elks Club is a possibility. Hubbard Park, a small section of Hubbard Park. But if you want to, it's important that dignity, privacy, agency, autonomy, and opportunity be kind of the five legs of a stool of how to support folks that are unhoused and give them every opportunity to get back into onto a firmer foundation. So showers, let's not miss the opportunity. We're going to tur turn down the 110 straight, State Street. But Ribellini and Ayers have empty barber shops now, which is a perfect place for public bathrooms and showers, for bikers, for old folks, for Appalachian Trail hikers, for unhoused people. We could, we could do public bathrooms on Elm Street right now in some of those vacant barber shops, right? And we should not miss that opportunity. It was always out of reach because no one was going to displace those tenants. Those tenants aren't there now. So we should, we should seize that opportunity. So... In a nutshell, we should have ordered, should have used some of that money and ordered shower and toilet trailers back then and then placed them where we want to encourage folks to stay out of watersheds. We don't want, I, I can imagine we don't want folks up on Payne Turnpike in the beautiful bucolic water supply 
that's a, that's like Eden up there, you know, around that reservoir. So there are plenty of areas, Hubbard Park, Peace Park, Confluence Park's out of commission for now. Uh, you get the idea. Thanks, Steve. I, I wish you had done more between then and now. Um, Rick DeAngelis, I see you're still on the uh, meeting. If you uh, have an answer to this question, uh, is uh, some kind of transportation up to the uh, shelter uh, part of the plan for this winter? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't address that. I knew there was one more thing. Yeah, we will be running um, a bus route up there uh, twice an evening. And um, so, yeah, but the problem is, is that um, we're going to fill up that our, our normal capacity is 15. Um, I have no doubt that we're going to fill up that shelter every night. Um, so I would say if there are other places that people can stay that work for them, they should stay there. Thanks. Linda, do you have one last thing? Yes. Um, I would like to reiterate that you're, you're currently, your policy currently um, is very heavy on maintaining the environment and the gateway park is, in, is considered environmentally fragile. Mill Pond Park, Harrison Preserve, Summer Street Park, and City Hall Plaza, all of which were listed on page 47 of the master plan are areas that have full access and are not, I don't believe, are not considered environmentally fragile. In addition to reusing specific non-sensitive areas in Hubbard Park and North Branch Park. So again, your policy is not supporting the environment if, at this point and people's needs, and okay. it just needs to be considered. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody on the council have anything else or are we set? Okay, thank you. Thanks for bringing this up, Linda. Item eight. Year end financials. Turn this over to the finance director, Sarah LaCroix. And are you going to be putting that on the screen or? Sarah LaCroix, the finance director. Um, this is the fiscal year 23 financial report out. Um, at this time, I just wanted to run through a, just a brief disclaimer. Um, given the flood and our work with FEMA recovery and finances relocation twice now, um, we are a little delayed. I don't expect that there will be significant or material changes to the numbers you're presented with tonight, um, but we still are doing our final stages of review and we'll be making adjustments and reallocations um, as we work towards getting ready for the audit. Um, the auditors also may or may not have adjustments to propose at that time, well, which would need to be considered. Um, and that because of the July flooding, they were supposed to come the last week of August and we were forced to delay um, that. So I, they will be here the week after Thanksgiving which will also delay the audit report out to you all. Um, I'm hoping that will be by the end of February, but it won't be before we um, do budget presentations for fiscal year 25. When they come, how long they yeah, are they physically on site typically? Um, they came for an interim visit in May, and then they usually are on site for about a week um, and then go back and do a lot of work. And I was an auditor before, so you know, the bulk of the work is not in the field, it's back at the office. Uh -huh. Thanks. Um, so this is just an all fund summary. Um, the red is obviously the shortfall, and the black is the surpluses. I, I'm not going to run through all of these right now, but I do have other slides that 
touch on them. Um, one of the big takeaways is that all of the funds experienced um, expenditure overages this year related to inflation as we rebounds, or rebounded excuse me, and worked towards a new normal from COVID-19. Um, to start, I want to start with the other governmental funds. Um, these are the Cemetery Parks Rec and Senior Center. The Cemetery Fund was, had a shortfall of 35000 That was primarily related to increased salary and wages. Uh, the Parks Fund had a $94,000 shortfall this year. Again, inflation was involved in that, along with expenses incurred related to Confluence Park. Um, just to caveat that, if we choose to move forward with the project, then these will be offset with grant revenue and bond proceeds. If not, they would be offset by the bond proceeds we currently have, so that would make up that shortfall in that fund. Um, the REC fund, as you can see, has a $1 million shortfall this year. That is only truly an $86,000 shortfall um, related to inflation and capital improvements to the pool bathrooms that they made out of their reserve account. And then 962,000 was transferred um, to cover the cost of Country Club Road as previously agreed upon. Um, and the, the big topic is the general fund for fiscal year 23 that has a shortfall of $755,509. Um, as we return to normal operations, we, there were difficult financial constraints from the pandemic that we really curbed spending and and tried to, to save and make sure we were operating at, not in a deficit in 22. And as we moved back into 23, we had deferred maintenance costs and city council and staff made decisions you know, during the fiscal year that um, impacted how it turned out. They knew there would be an adverse impact on fund balance at the time decisions were made. Um, but they were necessary to city operations. Um, and every effort was made during the year and especially in the final quarter to curb spending in an attempt to reduce what that impact looked like. Uh, we had a discretionary spending freeze that um, began at the end of February and we were very conscious about the purchases that were made, um, but there were still costs incurred as we needed to ramp up for construction season. Uh, I provided a five-page memo that kind of gave more detail than I have in these slides, and I apologize, they're very word-heavy. Um, but some items that impacted the general fund this year are the pilot payment that came in under budget because there's a statutory cap that Montpelier can receive um, that will also be under budget in 24, which I'm monitoring. Um, state highway aid came in under budget due to a reduction in the COVID money we had received in the prior years, so that was unanticipated. And then there were expenses that happened during the year, such as um, wage adjustments to the public works and police union agreements. Um, they were council decisions that knew we would have a, an impact on the financial statements, but they happened um, after the budget development. So they were decisions made to recruit and retain employees, which is important to city operations. Um, there were also significant staffing shortages and medical leaves throughout the year that caused overtime to be significantly over budget in several different departments, public works, police, dispatch, and fire. Um, and they needed the overtime costs to cover day-to-day -day services for the city. We also, as I've mentioned before, experienced inflationary product and service costs, uh, significant legal costs related to a complicated personnel matter, we had increased expenses related to the reappraisal and the changeover in assessors. There were delayed maintenance and increased fuel costs from the pandemic within the public works fleet that caused an increase in this year's expenses. And there were two transfers that were not included in the current year's budget, but were previously restricted and assigned in that other pot of fund balance that we talked about earlier that were transferred and they reflect as an adverse impact on this year's budget and how they're supposed to be recorded. Um, so I just, I kind of wanted to walk through a net impact of the last two years on our, our unassigned fund balance. I felt like that was important. So in FY23, we ended with a $755,000 deficit um, or shortfall. If you take away from that, the transfer that was previously restricted for reappraisal and the previously assigned energy fund transfer that was from a 21 budget, that brings us more to about a $590,000 shortfall. And when you take that with the surplus we had in the prior year of 466,000, we really are in the 
scheme of the two years reducing the unassigned fund balance by 124,000. Um, and we are in line with where we have historically been with the unassigned fund balance. I look back at 2019 pre-pandemic and our unassigned was around 800 to 900,000. So we are in line where we have been historically. Um, and at the end of this year, it will leave us with $719,939 to cover future shortfalls. So is that unassigned fund balance, what we've been talking about as a reserve? Yep, so the unassigned, that 719, is the part you did not just vote to commit. That's the part that is left over for a flood or mm -hmm. any, any unanticipated costs we would have. Um, so then uh, the next one is just a brief overview of the enterprise funds. The water fund was 196 to the positive, sewer was 51,000 to the negative, um, parking 45 positive, uh, district heat 200 negative. Um, both water and sewer had significant investments made in capital assets from both the sewer fund and the ARPA funds, um, which is really important to those funds and the city's infrastructure. Our parking revenue is now stabilizing and, or was stabilizing um, at the end of 23, and that will also be reevaluated in 24. And then district heat annually operates at a loss, um, as we've talked about in previous meetings doing the rates. So this is, is pretty in line with that. We're still working out some of the district heat numbers, but this is, I would say, pretty accurate. Um, the ARPA fund money, we received 2.2 million um, in ARPA funding. It's been allocated for equipment and projects related to lost revenue, investments in infrastructure and community outreach. At the end of FY23, we had between 22 and 23 spent a total of uh, $1,087,372 or 49% of that award. And it was put towards capital assets such as police department vehicles, park and rec vehicles, street sweeper, um, and as I mentioned previously, some of it was invested in water, sewer, and stormwater infrastructure. Um, so I guess in summary, uh, this was a tough year for the city, and there was significant inflationary pressure as we came back from the pandemic and tried to, to get our footing again and to catch up on deferred maintenance costs. Um, there were strategic decisions made by council and the city leadership to prioritize staff recruitment and retention. And prior to our current hiring freeze, we were basically fully staffed and operating at full capacity, which I think is impressive these days when you know it's it's difficult uh, hiring market. Um, uh, deferred maintenance costs because we have delayed equipment purchases. The equipment is aging, which then increases the cost to repair it when you have that. And um, so we talked about fund balance a little bit, but the policy is 15% of budgeted expenditures which is about 2.4 million. So at this point, with the 700,000, we are at about 30% of the targeted amount, which is not, not bad. Um, my previous experience has not a lot of municipalities have A, a fund balance policy or near enough or this amount to cover it. Um, and so as we work to the future, you know, we just will need to be cognizant and keep adding to that fund balance to ensure um, financial stability. Um, and, and like I said, this, the purpose of the fund balance was to cover unexpected expenditures and revenue shortfalls, which both were experienced in 23. Um, and just a look ahead at 24, we are currently operating under a hiring freeze, discretionary spending freeze, and only making purchases to keep the city operating, continuing projects we were already under contract with, and for flood recovery efforts. I'm tracking FEMA in a separate fund with the exception of labor and overtime that's still currently in the general fund. Um, and as of the date I did this, it was 515,000, um, but today we are at 689,000 in FEMA related expenses. And I'm working with FEMA to recoup those costs. Um, and we are also working to project revenue loss and present a mitigation plan for 24. That's Thanks, Sarah. 23. I've, got, I've got a few questions. I'm sure other people have uh, questions too. Uh, one of them is sort of in kind of a big picture thing. Um, obviously, the shortfall is a combination of being short on revenues and being high on uh, expenses. Correct. Do you know what the breakdown 
is roughly? I, I couldn't tell you that uh, right now. I can definitely give you that, but there's a there are a, a slew of revenue overs and revenue unders that net net to a less revenue, and same with expenses. There are a bunch that are under and over that kind of all get you back to where we landed. Uh -huh. And uh, you mentioned the overtime issue. Uh, was that <coughs> mostly from before we were fully staffed up, like at the police department, or it I, could, is it not possible to say that? Uh, we definitely had some before we were staffed up, and then there was some that continued with staffing outages and leaves. I wasn't here all year, so I'm you know doing my best if, if there's more to chime in. But um. okay, and and I've heard it suggested that uh, we've been spending money that wasn't either in the budget or approved by council. Um, could you address that? Yeah, so uh, when, when purchases greater than $10,000 are made that are you know in, in line with our policies, they're brought to council and council appropriates and approves those expenses. So any significant purchases that were made that would impact the budget were brought to council and approved. And the big ticket items were probably like the, the uh, contract increases. Yes, those were brought to council and presented knowing that they would have a significant impact on um, the year-end financial statements. Okay, thanks. Anyone else have any questions? Go on. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, first of all, just definitely uh, underscores the importance of the fund balance, so rebuilding it. Um, you know, we needed it this year and we're gonna need it, so just, um, Glad previous councils <laughs> uh, and city staff uh, have managed that. Um, I guess one question that comes to mind from looking at the overall summary. So, you know, some of this is kind of like things that came up unexpectedly or the inflation that was so high or, or things. I'm just trying to get a sense as we head into the next budget season, like what of these, like, what do you see as lessons learned? Like, I'm kind of surprised, like the cap on pilot, if that's a statutory thing, why did we not know that? How did we get that one wrong? And like the highway funds from the state, like some of those things that seem like, were, were we getting misinformation? And like, are we gonna get the right information for next year so that we can do better budgeting? Um, I guess just anything like that, like how are we getting that information? And can we so figure out one, obviously, well, no one knows what's going on in the future, but, um, at least the runaway inflation that we saw during this past fiscal year, which really drove everything, has come down somewhat. We will be in a position, you know, the, the pay adjustments have been made, we budget appropriately, the current budget should reflect that as well as the, the next budget. Um, I mean, we have to deal with our shortfall. You know, we know we're gonna have an issue this budget too, that's the deficit mitigation plan that Sarah talked about. Um, the, the interesting thing with the pilot, um, and you know, you're right, we probably should have known that. Um, the, I guess the good news is that is it's capped when we reach 100% of state tax payment. And so that means the state is fully paying its property tax for, um, for its, its, uh, the municipal property tax for its state-owned properties as per their formula. Now, they, you know, they set the value. And, uh, and, and, but uh, it is designed so that we, we get a statutory payment as well as the, as the so as well as a share of the local options tax. And so we had received an estimate based on what they were projecting for local options tax increase, and that's what the increase was based on. But I think even the state at the time didn't catch that. You know, anybody, it's not just us. Anybody who hits 100% then doesn't get any more, which makes sense. They're not going to pay 110% of their tax. So. That's so. That's an adjustment we have to make, and then uh, the state's decision on changing the highway aid occurred during the session after we had um, set the budget. So. The known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Yeah. And, okay. Any other questions from members of the council? Okay. Thanks so much, Sarah. You've made it very understandable. Great report. Yes. <laughs> no, that's that's okay. It's very good. Yeah. All right. Item nine, interim zoning. Mike, is that you? That would be me. All right. 
All right, good evening, Mike Miller. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development. So um, what we have for the interim zoning, and I'll just kind of hit the high points. Um, as a result of the Country Club Road project being proposed, we needed to make sure that we streamlined our permitting process to allow us to be able to issue those permits when the project comes to us. Uh, so we took a look through the zoning, Meredith and I, Meredith Crandall, who's the zoning administrator, and I took a look through the zoning. We came up with as succinct a set of changes as we could. There are lots of ways we could get there, but we tried to try to keep it as simple and straightforward as possible. And so the proposal, kind of working backwards from the definitions forward, we have a definition currently in our zoning for temporary housing, and that includes emergency shelters and homeless shelters. And so that exists in definition, it also exists on the use table. But what we're looking at for FEMA really doesn't fit that definition, because it's not temporary in the sense of a, a homeless shelter, because those are usually considered temporary housing because you aren't being there, you're not supposed to be there more than 30 days. You don't become a, a resident, a tenant of that property. So usually the definition of a homeless shelter, an emergency shelter, is looking at staying for less than 30 days. You might be less than 30 days, be gone for a couple of days, and then you can come back for another period of time. But you're not there on a continuous basis. Emergency housing, like we're talking about for FEMA, you're going to be there for two or three years. That is your home. That is your residence. You live there. So we decided we, uh, what we would do is to uh, propose striking the temporary housing and instead replacing it with two separate uses, one being emergency housing and one being emergency shelter. And we provide definitions of that, um, which I think laid out just some of the basics of, of what you would expect. And in order to keep this from being abused in some ways, the emergency housing definition, really, it could be a dwelling unit or a congregate housing, which is provided by federal, state, or local government to provide housing for a specific population on an emergency housing basis for a period not to exceed three years. So we specifically limited it just to public agencies. So somebody couldn't come in as a private entity and decide, oh, I'm going to take advantage of this. I can get permits to do stuff without having to do what everybody else is required to do. I'll just call it emergency housing. No, you have to be a state, federal, or that's what we have proposed, limiting it to gov some government agency. Um, it may be operated by somebody else, but it would be have to be owned by or managed by one of the, the government entities. And then um, we had to add, we have replaced in the use table, which is in the, in the front part, we replaced uh, temporary housing with emergency shelter. We didn't change any of the requirements. P's means it's a permitted use, and you could just get the permit administratively. C means it's a conditional use in those districts. And we added a new use up under residential. Um, so residential are all things where you have tenancy. These are all different places where you where these are housing units, um, whether it's congregate or dwelling units. And so for emergency housing, we made it permitted all the way across, which is what we've been talking about. We want to streamline this process if it's an emergency housing. So we've made it a permitted use. And then to further clarify, that's where kind of the middle page comes in. We added in what's called a specific use standard, where we kind of lay out some rules and say, all right, what do we expect out of our applicant in this? Um, and one is the, um, the, the applicability, the process is Emergency housing is a permitted use in all districts, and therefore reviews are administrative. Any additional reviews, so let's say Country Club Road, would generally be a major site plan. You're building something new. That would have to go to the DRB. Uh, what we proposed in here is any additional reviews, like site plan reviews or other development review approvals, like steep slopes, um, will be reviewed administratively, except for variances and appeals. And that is. Um, simply comes down to a due process requirement. Uh, those are, variances are actually a form of appeal. And so appeals really have to go to a board. So if for some reason this gets appealed, um, there's nothing we can do about it as staff. That's just uh, neighbors, uh, the public, they have rights to appeal, due process rights. Those would have to go to a development review board. Um, and then we have some basic requirements that we put in there. Um, 
the changes must be temporary. Um, they must be reversible, and that's true of the FEMA proposal. They, they would build these things in, and if after that time, they would actually remove them if we ask them to. Uh, emergency housing can be either dwelling units or congregate housing. We were trying to think a little bit bigger, um, things that we might see in the future. If FEMA had gone to, say, um, VCFA, to say, hey, there's a dormitory. That's congregate living. We want to be able to issue an emergency permit that would say, hey, you can use a dormitory for congregate living. And so we laid out a few rules. I won't go through all of them, um, but my purpose for being here today was just to kind of lay this out and make sure you think we're on the right path. Are there questions you would want answered? Because you can't make a decision tonight because this has to get a adopted after public hearing, which has already been warned for October 11th, uh, your next meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had to warn it in the paper 15 days in advance, so we put that in the paper. So that's already in for the 11th. But I did want to get this to you. You can make changes on the 11th and still adopt it. If there are things you want me to look at, whether there are things you want to tell me tonight or anything you think of in the next two weeks, just let me know and I can try to come prepared with either alternative language or questions to answer. Um, and again, we put this together relatively quickly. so. It, it is possible we missed something or overlooked something or we're just missing on a policy statement. This has been put together by two people and got, got here just so we've got our foot in the door so we can start having a conversation. Fortunately, two people are very good at their jobs. But <laughs> 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 Thanks, Mike. Any questions from council? So, Are there any special requirements for documentation for this particular permit versus other permits? Uh, for like application requirements? Yeah, the, is it the usual usual stuff? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean it's going to be, we, it can, we can require whatever we want to in the application and it'll, and it'll depend on what the proposal is. So let's say the, the proposal we're looking at for Country Club Road, we are going to have to see but, where the road's going to be. Yeah, that's a pretty roads. elaborate proposal, yeah. Yeah, where are you going to put the buildings because you are building buildings? If this had been a proposal for BCFA or some other place for a dormitory, the requirements would be much less. You just have to demonstrate you can meet the requirements. Good, thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions. Up, oh, Steve. Uh, Steve Whitaker, I, I want to just raise a, a question or an observation that two or three years is going to give both the unhoused uh, potential rights of tenancy, which triggers long court processes to terminate. Uh, I don't know how or what workarounds there are for that, um, and I don't think that by casting it in a policy or in a zoning, you can circumvent that. So I know that some of the shelters ask people to, or even hotels, move every 30 days to a different room in order to prevent that from attaching. But I'm, again, I'm supportive of use of Country Cup Road. It'll give us time to put, to do our due diligence on what other long-term development's gonna go up there. It'll get us some low cost, core infrastructure up there, even if we sell it, you know? But I want to encourage you to think about private distributed huts that are more dignified than a, and, and safe than a congregate shelter. Thanks, Steve. Uh, uh, by the way, the, for the hotel and motel uh, tenancy exception, moving, it, moving from one room to another in the same hotel does not uh, preclude the attachment of tenancy? Right. They have to, but moving from one motel to another motel owned by the same entity does. Uh, that's in part of the uh, tax department regulations because the way that works is uh, you're staying in a hotel or motel is exempt as long as it's covered by the rooms and meals tax, and that's 30 days. Um, Thanks, Mike. Is there any other questions, or are we good to go? And I, thanks. Okay, thank You're you. Set. All right. Up to number ten, Confluence Park update. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This was actually requested by Councilmember Heaney to be on the agenda. Um, I think there's been a question in the community about whether we would continue this project. As you recall, a year or so ago, we provided direction to the organizing group that the city had passed a bond for 600,000 and would not put any additional city funds in and gave them a, a period of time, I think it was 18 months, to uh, raise the, r the rest of the funds through other means and or to see if they could. And, uh, and the city simply put that project on hold. I think given the circumstances now, uh, flooding, the condition of the space, uh, and uh, other circumstances. Uh, again, I, I don't want to speak for Councilmember Heaney, I, but our staff uh, certainly would be comfortable if we were to discontinue that project and either just not float the remainder of the bond to save on debt payments or reallocate it to other capital needs that we have. That would be a future decision of yours. We do need to do so um, with our eyes wide open that, that we did have accepted close to $150,000 in grants. Uh, that would need to be repaid. And so, in fact, uh, Sarah mentioned some of that um, in the financial statement, so we would have to let the bond for at least that much. Uh, we're trying to work with the contractors. I, I, you know, I, I realize that if, we, if you choose to cancel the project, it probably will remain canceled, but we'd still like to get as much of the design work that we've paid for as possible so that we have a tangible benefit of that money so that in the future, five, 10, 20, whatever, some period of time in the future if the, if the community wants to revisit it, there's already work done that was paid for that doesn't need to be redone. So we're trying to find that right spot so we have an asset at least for, for the money. So that's our, our suggestion, but really it's your, I turn, I'd turn. i say let the sponsor of the, uh, of the bill. But we've already incurred some of that Cost oh yeah, absolutely. Yes, we absolutely work. have. Yes. I don't know how much, but, but well, it's about 100. I think it's about 150 thousand that we've incurred. Okay. So that's we would be cap. We would be pretty much stopping. We're just trying to find the right stop point to make sure we have something of value. Yep. Um, but we would stop. Have we've paid it? So essentially, what it means is we've already paid it. We just wouldn't get the grant to pay it back. To pay to it back. It. So we would have, we'd have to float the bond to pay essentially the the deficits that we've incurred already. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Unless we chose not to. Just came to my attention looking at warrants we sign and occasionally expenses we're paying out. So I thought it was a project on hold and wondered what's going on. And um, and then seeing it show up again in the deficit side as a, as a factor for one of the departments. Um, and, yeah, and obviously we're just basically looking at what's going on in terms of payments we've been making for a project that I perceive was on hold, but it's not totally on hold if it's happening. Um, and very honestly, before the flood, hearing about the, the way the costs had risen for this project, it may have been a good idea when it started, but when anything spins seemingly out of control as much as this one has, um, sometimes it's just not a project you should do. You know, you've got to look back and say, started out with great intentions, but you know, at 750 or whatever it was initially, um, now it's close to 3 million, and does this make any sense? I don't feel it does. So that's why I brought it up tonight to say, as a council, if there's any guidance we should give the staff and the community on it, if, if it's just not gonna happen, which post flood, I don't think this one is, um, maybe we should communicate that and um, move on. You know, if they can reuse the funds, allocate it toward another project that, that could be beneficial, that would be terrific. But I think this one uh, just doesn't look viable to me. So, so um, just, Quickly on that before you have your deliberation. So this is 100% a council decision. It was yeah. a council decision to proceed in the, the way that we did. Mm. Council initiated project. So really it's up to you to decide what you want to do with it. And then we don't have to make any decisions tonight, tonight about what to do with. Again, we don't have the, the balance of the funds in hand. It's an approved bond. So we would have to let the rest of the bond for a specific purpose. And we do have some flexibility in the bond wording. Um, or which would then incur those bond payments or just not do it and not have those bond payments and use that bonding capacity on a different issue. So those are all choices you could make in the future if you were to choose and you don't have to solve all those problems tonight. But uh, what, any direction you want to provide with that is really. And Bill, I've got two questions. Uh, one is that if I recall correctly, the, the 600,000 we allocated for Confluence Park was part of a bigger bond that was correct. Confluence Park and other 
uses. So uh, correct, it was either one. I think it might have been one point eight million dollar total bond. Right. So we we can flex that money within the use of that bond for other purposes, or just not let that portion. And and then the other thing is that uh, when we when we decided a year or so ago that we're going to put it on hold, not go forward at this point, we I think there was a considerable sentiment to just pulling the plug then, but the people who were trying to, uh, there were people trying to raise private funds to, uh, to generate the rest of the income for it. And, and I wonder if you've heard from anyone who was doing that to say, hey, don't do this because we're $10,000 short of the $2 million or anything like that. I haven't. I'm looking around. No, no that's not the case. <laughs> that's what I thought. OK. Um, any other? Uh, Donna, then Sal? So I have two questions. One is, I felt that we were not allocating any additional funds to be spent at this point than what we'd already allocated, separate from that which was going the bond yeah, if we went the further. Council's decision was that, and, and again, you were told that the design work was yes, being done yes. and funded by the grant, yep. and that that was going to be moving on. But the council's decision was that the city would not put more than $600,000 total into the right. project. Right. That what we had allocated was that, and if the group wanted to um, you know, raise the balance, you gave them 18 months to do so, uh, to consider whether to go forward with the full project. And understanding that if we, at any point, yes. chose not to do it, we would have to eat the cost expended to date for the grant. OK. So the money on which, indeed, the, that's been, some month been spent for consultants that you don't yet know the full amount is coming out of that 600000 Correct. OK. So I thought we also, and I sort of disagree with Jack, I still support the idea because I think it goes right in hand with getting rid of our dams, facing the river, using the river, whether it gets modified, downscaled, I still think that's a good thing to happen eventually. But so I thought at one point, even this council did a vote to give them 18 months. Correct. And is that up? No. I, I thought this next summer was going to be Yeah, up. no, no. This, the 18 months is definitely not passed. There's some time. The, 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 the question was raised by Councilmember okay. Heaney no. whether we so, should consider. Right. OK. I just and, want to make sure. and we as staff are saying, yep. you know, it's, we'd support that if that's what you want to do. Well, I guess I, I feel definitely we'll have some conversation about it. And we should include our partners we give the 18 months to. Uh, and maybe, you know, that's where I'm coming from. I just don't want to sh leave the ship yet. Well, there's nothing, there's, I don't mean to keep <laughs> carrying this conversation, but I mean, there's nothing precipitous about making a decision tonight as opposed to two weeks from now or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's not, we're not going to spend any more or less money. We're coming to an end point of this design work, and that's going to be the end of it. And, okay. um, so Good. you could choose when, you know, if you want to revisit it with inviting the other partners in, you could do that or you can make a decision. It's really, again, entirely up to you. So, so um, I'm a little clear on that where we are with the design work. Are we coming to the end or are we at the end? Have we made the final payment on the design work? No, we're about 85% uh, done with design work. Um, and, and Josh, could you identify yourself? Josh Drome, Community and Economic Development Specialist. Uh, so about 85 percent. So uh, the the 15 percent would add to the 150 thousand, or right. What we've told them is because we've seen that this is probably um, you know not moving down 100 percent. They they wanted to do permitting. We've said no, that's not going to be part of this. Let's just wrap it up, get it to 90 percent done, and see where we are from there. And what will that cost? Do they have a, uh, they said that they would be um, done by October for that. But dollars and cents? I, I don't know what that don't is. Know. The bulk of the work is done. Yeah. So there would be the final. The, the, yeah. yeah. Uh, the design part will be done, the permitting and all the other stuff will be done. I, I guess, I mean, I, I understand uh, the thinking of, you know, having a, something of value when you have a sunk cost like the 150000 but. You know, we have a commission that's going to be looking at things like what, we, what do we do with the river? And I have a feeling that 
the confluence is actually going to be a big part of that, and we may be designing something that just doesn't make any sense. I don't know why we can't halt the designing where it is and pick it up okay. 10 years from now if, if we decide not to do anything else. Um, it just seems like that, that project at this particular time is not going anywhere. Uh, in fact, I, I would say it probably shouldn't go anywhere. There are better places we can spend the money now. So that's just my feeling about Confluence Park. Okay. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Thanks, everyone, for, uh, and Evelyn, and thanks for that longer break. We're st still on. Um, item 10, Confluence Park uh, update, and I'm trying to remember who the last speaker was and where we were. Did you have any? Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. <laughs> I, I, hopefully this makes sense now. So um, I guess one thought and one question. It seems like wrapping up and not expending, you know, getting to a point, I mean, I like the idea of having some kind of leaving it at a point where we've got something that we could then refer back to and build on when we pick it up. I, it does seem like there's so many important priorities right now. Before we did anything like entirely nix the project, I would definitely want to invite Vermont River Conservancy, our partner, to come in and have a conversation and understand what's what the state is, what's happening. And it's maybe they're the people to ask for my next question, which is like, is there is there any piece of the project that they could fund that would allow us to not have to give back that grant money? Or like, is there any way to be able to move forward some piece if the nonprofit was funding it and doing the work that we could take advantage thing. of that rather than having to return the money? So that would be my question for them. Mm -hmm. is, is, there, is there any way to not forfeit that? If so, so that's good question. Okay. Any other questions you know, up here? Do you know what should we have in mind? I don't know what the answer to that. There's a $1.8 million gap. Um, so I'm not, I know but, there's... But do you have to do an entire project to give back planning money, for example? Or could you show, we, you know, in year one, we have done this piece of it. It might be year five that we do the next pieces or something. like. Well, as, as a lot of grants have, you know, a period of performance, um, and this has continued to extend and amendments after amendments, um, so uh, yeah, we can go back to those those grantors. Um, I mean, they've also said that we can in our community should give us a little extra time. They've also said that we can return it and we can reapply when we are ready, um, because it's some of it. Yeah, some of it is planning, but a lot of it is implementation. Okay. And that's why it got so so expensive when it looked like the implementation was going to be so much more costly. <laughs> right. I think I think the initial application. The, the, the costs, the implementation costs weren't quite, um, they weren't all known at the time. Of course, there was a brownfield. Um, that's a $600,000 cost in itself. So that was not known at the time of application. Thanks. Kaylin. Uh, yeah, I just want to. And try to really speak up. OK. There we go, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's the separate, right? So um, again, I, I just want to repeat, if any other uh, funds are available by the, our partners, so how much they collected, and will they be okay? Just leave the money behind because maybe they collected some just to use for this project. And the second thing, if we, if the city um, council decides not to continue, can we use the um, place for other things? Because we are talking about um, completing some of the design, right? Will it be possible to use it for other things? So the design would really be the paper design, the, the, the oh, okay. engineering design. We wouldn't be doing the work okay. on the okay. site. So the site could yes. be completely used for whatever else. We could. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Okay, we'll go to uh, members of the public. There are a few people online. Um, do we know Genrik Yagoda? Okay, we'll skip over that 
or are you trying to? Hi. Okay, great. I just had a quick question about when the public comment is. I didn't see it on the agenda. Um, we had uh, general business and appearances, which is public comment at the at the very beginning of the meeting. Um, are you so you're not trying to comment about this item? No, I'm sorry. I okay. It. No okay. worries. Thank okay, you. thank you. Um, it's always just about the first item on the agenda. Uh, Joe. Uh, hi, thanks, Jack. Um, I agree with Tim and some of the other people who weighed in saying that if there's a way that we can reallocate the funds um, for Confluence Park, I'm in favor of that. I just think that would make sense. And I do apologize. I know you were saying that not to go back to a previous topic. However, I just wanted to briefly address the interim zoning. Um, I know that Joe, we're- I'm, Joe, I'm going to suggest yeah. that you save the yeah. comment for the next meeting. We, it is on our agenda already for October 11th. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> Steve. Uh, Steve Whitaker again. Yeah. Um, I'm concerned that the planning and the design that's being done for Confluence Park that might be shelled for 10 years or indefinitely may not have been addressed whether or not the dams get removed. And it would be uh, a waste of any more money until that question is answered to, to spend anything whatsoever further. But I also want to point out that there's a need for remediation after the flood there. That's that's a key piece of our bike path and the first turn and the granite benches and the inches and inches of silt. There was a campground there, that, a camper and a tent and that just, so we need to find a source of funds to either cap, if that's the proper way to cap that silt uh, or remove the silt and I don't know if any of these funds can be used that way but we can't ignore the fact that that needs to be done that the bike path is still covered with silt in some areas all the way down to employment and training in the liquor board I went down that far today so I just want to point out that we need access to some funds we may need if it's possible for these bonded funds for that confluence park to get used for remediation mm -hmm. thanks uh, it's possible okay it's there's a range of things other than confluence park that that money could be used for all right and well, bill is that uh, remediation for the bike path one of the uh, ticket items with fema do you know uh if there's damage it would be i don't know about cleanup we're okay. going to follow up on the cleanup and okay, get back thanks. to you about that um Mary Kate, hello. Uh, just a technical comment. I believe there's at least one person in the waiting room to get back into this meeting on Zoom. I'm just wondering if someone could check. Oh, good, thank you, we're on it. Thank you. Um, so council, what's your- Someone's waving their hand. Okay, who is that? Devorah Jonas. Devorah Jonas? Yes. Okay. I think we're in the process of unmuting you. Oh, you have to unmute yourself, Devorah? I've done it a couple. Okay, can you hear me now? Here we are. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, basically, I also think that the money that's been set aside for continuing the project should be used for something else at this time. And that's everything else has been said. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great, thanks. So, okay, Council, um, what's your pleasure? Donna. I would go along with what Lauren was talking about, that we invite our partners on that project to come in at the next meeting or as soon as possible within our agendas, PACNIS, uh, to actually discuss the project and get an update from them, and then go ahead and make whatever decision we want to make. But I, I would like to see us finish the, gen uh, the current a design pro, uh, contract and then halt. So okay. that's where I would lean. Is that good for you, Tim? Yes. 
All right, everybody okay with that? <laughs> I don't see any reason to complete the design, frankly. But you, you're okay with putting it I doubt it if you, I mean, my experience is you, even if you have a completed design and you shelve it for five years or 10 years, whatever it is, when you take it up again, the new, <laughs> the new designer has their own idea. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, we have 85% of an asset. I think that's enough. I, I don't know what, what the extra 5% is, but I can't believe it makes that much of a difference. But I don't know what the cost is either, so. Well, we'll try to get that in for the next meeting. Too. Okay. Tim. I guess really, I was thinking more, it was just to bring in the other partners and, yeah, and yeah. have that conversation more than, but you're right. I think yeah. if we can get to, that I'll next step, that. just to have all the information and then oh. make a decision. Yeah. Is that, and as I recall, we've been talking for years about applying for funding to study what is study dam removal, but I don't think there's that's anything. That's happened. There are grants for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Lauren. There's definitely a lot of study. There's a lot of money for dam removals right now. I know that we brought that up when River, Vermont River Conservancy was here, so that was part of the plan to Steve's question, that it was in their thinking and is part of like their long-term vision for the area. Um, at least, you know, a couple of the dams, like obviously we're not talking about Wrightsville, <laughs> but the, right. the little, the little, bumpy, the little bumpy ones um, close to town. Um, and just, just noting the design, which we'll talk, like we, <laughs> we're shelving, but like they had built it to be flooded, like assuming it would be flooded it, like repeatedly. Yeah. So that, that was assumed. So, but, um, but yeah, dam removal was part of that. So, but we could ask them what the status of that is. Okay. Thanks, so we'll find a time for, for an upcoming agenda. Thanks. Oh, so I'm sorry, yes. So since uh, we decided uh, to have other uh, partners, um, will we uh, give them a specific time that, oh, we are discontinuing this project until this, or it will be completely done? That will be the decision you make after you hear from them. Okay, afterwards, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because when we voted, I said no to this project, so now if we, I just want to learn yeah. if the decision will be different. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Item number 11, 110 State Street. Um, so some of you may remember that uh, the state expressed interest in selling the 110 State Street building and um, extended a right of the first refusal or at least uh, the opportunity for the city to express its interest in purchasing the building and we have to give them a clear indication of what we're going to do by October 15th. Uh, at the time the mayor and I discussed this item we weren't sure whether we were going to be having an October 11th meeting it looks like we are now so this was the last last chance to do so to meet their time frame. Uh, you know, I think we weren't 100% enthused about the idea in the first place, but at least thought it might be worth to, to think about it. But given everything else on our plate, given staff resources and, and everything else, um, and, and there's some limitations with that building, doesn't really have any land that comes with it. Um, so I, 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 we recommend staff doesn't have a specific city need for it. We would have to develop a, you know, a partner arrangement to buy it and then sell it. And, You've heard the financial situation, you know, we don't really have a lot of flush cash to do that. So we'd recommend that we pass on it, but again, this is 100% your, your choice. Any thoughts from anyone? Any, no, anybody who wants, who thinks we should go ahead with this? All right, That's, that seems easy enough, thanks. And I don't think it takes a vote or anything. It would take an affirmative take vote, a vote to, to do, do something. something. Yeah. <laughs> and this is not doing something. Next up, we have the outside agency policy. So um, we discussed this uh, policy at length uh, in the last meeting in June. And uh, you had given us some feedback and thought and basically wanted me to come back. And it, so basically, you decided sort of three parts of it and still wanted to consider a, another couple. So I uh, tried to phrase that. I went back and actually watched the discussion and tried to make the, the memo, the update memo, reflect that conversation. And um, obviously, we were going to get at it at the next meeting or two after June 26th. Then 
you know, that it uh, didn't happen. So here we are, and uh, but it, it is timely in that we are moving into budget season, and I think in terms of giving agencies uh, adequate time if they do need to petition or just to know what the rules of the game are, I do think we need to make a decision uh, pretty quickly. So, I th you know, really, again, it's how, how you prefer to proceed. Uh, given the information, I know there's a couple agencies on here that want to comment, um, and I'm happy to answer any more questions that I can answer that we haven't already written up for you. Okay. Anyone here at, uh, on council who has any thoughts for starters? Go ahead, Tim. Oh, well, okay, Donna. Go ahead. You can start that in. No, I was just pointing. Oh, she was just telling. She was just telling me that you were up. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, I I do think that we we need to set a, a limit to how large requests can go through the Montpelier Community Fund, but the Montpelier Community Fund has developed such good criteria, an excellent application review process. They're very thorough. And I think they do a good job looking out for us to make sure that it's a valuable service to the community, but it's also a diversified service. And so I think it's better when the arts are mixed in there. When I see the word public art, I think of our arts commission, and I want them to be separate from this. Uh, some of the arts that are there are individuals, but they're also art programs for youth. And to me, that's separate from public art. Uh, and so I would like to leave it more as a, a one, one sum, but like cap it off at $10,000. Anything $10,000 or more needs to then either petition city council or city council puts them on the ballot without a petition. I think we can develop our own criteria as to what we decide that will allow on the ballot without petitions. And I do think we have to consider that although we're not in the pandemic, we still have <laughs> The COVID is going around, we have flu, we have so many more situations that we're aware of that it's not always capable with people with disabilities or women, it's more and more difficult. People who are non-white, it's harder for them to go to the door, knock and, and ask for signatures. And I don't think that signatures are as direct as allowing an item to go to the voters and getting a voter to then say yes or no. So I would rather see more things that the council puts on the ballot once we've evaluated as a worthwhile service that goes to the community residents than having people collect signatures. So that's my advice. So to be clear, Donna, are you saying that our policy should be entities are asking for up to $10,000 could apply to the community fund and? Apply to the council direct. And above 10,000 go to the council directly? Yeah, ab above 10,000 go to the council. And? Yeah, and under go to the Montpelier Fund. And no uh, petition requirement for anyone? Uh, only if the council deems it when that request comes to them. I see. That the council would decide. Mm -hmm. Okay. And any criteria like we've been doing in recent years of saying that people who uh, are entities that have been funded before don't have to petition? I think that I would put that in there. I think once it, it's voted, that as long as it stays the same amount, that we should put it on the ballot. Again, let the voters decide. And I think the other thing we need to consider is that there's no downtown stores to put your petitions in, or not very many. So I think it's a really different year uh, this year. But I think the old school is that petition is knocking door to door. I think that's really hard to do these days. Okay. Anybody else have any thoughts before we Just open it up? Just a technical thought, um, and I'm sure you'll hear this, I, I shouldn't say I'm sure, I suspect you'd hear this from the agencies. Um, I think if the council is going to consider putting items on the agenda, you should set a hard date by which you will make that decision because I could imagine a circumstance where it gets to be January mm -hmm. and you're looking at your budget and deciding something's got to go and then to opt to put, uh, you know, not put an agency on the ballot and they don't have time to exercise their legal right to petition. So I think, you know, again, it's your policy, but I think just from a practical standpoint, you need to think about how 
how to communicate so people have cl really clear expectations and understanding that petitioning is a lot of work and people need time to, to handle that. So if, if you're going to make a petition, tell them you know, now. If, if you're not, then they kind of need to know. I, again, I don't want to speak for them. They'll speak for themselves. But I, I, I would imagine that will be an issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, it probably should be decided like August when the weather's decent. <laughs> that was the plan. <laughs> yeah, we were going <laughs> to. Right? We were planning to do it in August. But yes. here we are. Okay. Any council members want to be heard before I start? <laughs> weather well, wasn't decent in August. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I wonder about the uh, uh, just, putting th just putting things on the ballot doesn't inform the, the public. I mean, I don't know, you know, I read those blurbs on the, I mean, before I was, when I was just an ordinary citizen, not, not on the council and figuring out, you know, getting more information about what this stuff was about, you read the blurb on the ballot, and some people don't do that until they get to the booth. Um, and because you voted for it last year, you vote for it this year, and you really don't know, you, d you don't know what, how it affects the big picture. And I just wonder if there's a better way to communicate that if we're going to, if we're going to start deciding to put things on a ballot without a petition. I mean, the petition process is really a pretty small obstacle in the way of that anyway. I think most people are willing to sign a petition just to, you know, to allow the, the city to decide on an issue. So I would, m maybe it's not appropriate to attach it to this somehow, but I, it, there's got to be a way to better inform the public what, what these ballot measures are about and what they, the effect they have on the, on the rest of the ballot, on mm -hmm. the rest of the budget. Okay. I, I don't know if we've ever I, done that. I think it's an appropriate part of the discussion because, you know, we don't have a motion at this point. We're just talking about yeah. it. Yeah. And Donna, yeah. Well, I was just wondering. I mean, you said you mentioned the petition. Is it anything more than a barrier, though? They don't. Do they know anything about what's going before the voters when they sign that petition? I don't think they do. So it's, it's, it that's is a I, barrier. It's that's not what a I'm saying. Tool. So it's a, you know. <laughs> So they do a presentation at the council, and then the public has a chance to talk to them. We could do that. So we, we, you know, leaping yeah. over the petition requirement, that that's okay. I, I, it's okay if I think we can somehow shore up information, make the make the public better informed about what they're voting, yeah. For, yeah. they're voting for or against. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Tim. It seems like part of the crux of the problem is this tension between our schedule and. These are organizations that wish to you know, be supported, and if we don't support them, that they have to go through this petition. That's their appeal, I guess. Um, and, and to have all that happen in time with a town meeting in March, uh, when our budget process isn't going to be done before January, right? Uh, so if, a, if, in effect, they want to be able to avail themselves of that petition, then right now we're at 10 percent, I believe, of the registered voters. Yeah. And the state standard, I think, is I heard from Sandy, <laughs> was five percent. Um, you know, if you're worried about contact and people having to get out, it would it be more reasonable to look at the state standard? If, if that's the appeal they choose to take, at least it would be more reasonable for them to do. And is that in the charter bill? Yes, that was so that would have to be. So that was proposed. Um, I can't remember what particular. What precipitated it particularly, but I think there was a concern that um, for money items, you know, even a bond or anything like that, that the that it should be a higher bar than you know just a petition to support whatever social issue or whatever. That um, that if it's something that's really binding the city and and causing taxes, that it should be. So the, the, the then council put it on the ballot, it passed, the legislature passed it, so it's. It's now our charter, so it would require a charter change to change that. Which is a bigger deal, obviously. Yep. Yeah. But it can be done. Yep. John. And just so you all know, I do have this vehicle that nobody ever uses for anything called Mont MontpelierVoterGuide.org. Actually, that's not true. Candidates use it. Candidates will send me information with their pictures and a blurb about themselves. But one part of it has always been I put up all the ballot articles and invite anybody to submit pro and con um, 
statements, editorials on it. Nobody's ever done that. That might be a vehicle to maybe that's something so that should be to advertise you. something you all could play with and could use that as long as it's sitting there with its cute little domain name and everything. Yeah. Hello. We need a raffle prize. <laughs> okay, let's let's go to the public. Uh, Dan Groberg, you're up first. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Dan Groberg. I'm executive director of the Cal Cobert Library. I'm a resident of Montpelier. I'm also a member of the Community Fund Board, um, but I'm speaking this evening only in my capacity as resident and director of the library as the Community Fund has not had any formal conversations about this topic. Um, first, I believe Councilwoman Bate has a conflict of interest in this conversation as an employee of one of the recipients of Community Fund Board funds. Um, so I'm just putting that out there. Um, but uh, I, I believe the petition process creates an unnecessary administrative burden for the organizations that are petitioning, especially the library. We've received between 85 and 90 percent support every year. Um, and, you know, especially this year uh, with our time greatly consumed with flood recovery at the library, um, the petition process just seems like um, an unnecessary burden. Uh, to place on the library. Um, and uh, very few organizations do petition annually, um, which I think is evidence of community fund board process is working as intended. Um, so I'd, I'd ask the council to waive the petition or continue to waive the petition requirement for uh, the library and perhaps other organizations as well. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Any other members of the public? Steve. Steve Whitaker again. You heard this before, but I'll reiterate it uh, because of the timeliness of this discussion. More and more government is delegating or outsourcing government functions to nonprofits, and that breaks the accountability chain. You can have all the flowery praise for how that money was spent, but unless you have public records access to what went wrong or how the money was misspent or misappropriated or stolen, we don't really know. We're, we're basically abdicating the fiduciary duty of the council when we give money to a nonprofit that is not bound by public records law. So I think we, if you're developing this policy, we need to put some maybe not as, as forceful, almost certainly not as forceful as public records law, but there needs to be some accountability and transparency with these organizations that are, Good Samaritan is a good example, right? Things have gone really wrong at Good Samaritan and they've been swept under the rug, you know? Not in recent, not in my recent experience, but in past, past times. Uh, Montpelier Alive, you know? They brought false charges against me, organized by Mr. Groberg, and they claimed we're not subject to public records law, even though they're housed in City Hall, they're funded by the city. They, you know, this is, you're breaking the accountability chain of, of a government function by not implementing a policy that provides some level of transparency and access to records within these organizations. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sandy. Hi, good evening. So a couple things. I so first off, more or less Sandy, comments. Sandy, then, Sandy, just a moment. You, Could you yeah. identify yourself, please? Sure, I'm sorry. I'm Sandy Roos. I'm president and CEO of Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice. Thanks for having me and thanks for allowing me to comment. Um, like I said, I just want to make a few comments. First of all, from a Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice perspective, and I think you can tell from the documentation provided in your packet, I believe we have shown um, demonstrated voter approval over many years with a significantly high rate of approval, I'd say upper 80s to 90% on any given year. And I think we've been through this process many times with regards to petitioning and the numbers that we've had to collect um, over 600, you know, just really goes to show the commitment that we have to the community with our service as well as the commitment we have to do the work to get the money and how much it's needed to, to support the services. 
Um, secondly, more or less a clarification, which you may have received an email forwarded from me um, through Bill and through City Manager Frazier. The request for 2021, 22, and 23 for Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice did not include any increase. We level funded. The last time we went for an increase was in um, for 2019 when we, gonna, we were going to petition, which we did, and we had to obtain 650 signatures, which we did. Um, another thing is that Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice is a member of the Joint Petition Committee. We participated in that for many, many years. Um, we every year are in coordination with other organizations collecting signatures for different towns. So multiple agencies can be put on the ballot, not only us. In through this process and through my research and, and going back and looking at the work that's been done with this committee, we have asked many organizations over the years to petition with us for the city of Montpelier and they've chosen not to join us in that petition process. So there is that choice, I believe as Bill you know, documented that they do go to the community fund if they receive less, they've chosen not to work as a team to really get those signatures so that they could be put on the ballot with us as well. And then I think my last thing was really um, piggybacks on, I believe it was Dan, um, that spoke a bit earlier about the petition process. And I know I'm looking at the 23 towns that we provide service to and the 23 towns that we receive funding from. My research has shown 10 uh, cities or towns require petitioning only if it's a first request or an increase. And those are the larger cities such as Barry City, Berlin, Waterbury, um, so the larger ones and then there were three that petition always. Those are smaller ones, Orange, Roxbury, and Middlesex. And Middlesex is a little bit different in their approach. And then there were nine that have no clear petition process. Lots of times, if anything, we go in front of the select board of the committee that oversees town funding. And we provide a presentation, um, reasoning behind why we're requesting the increase, et cetera. And or... Um, there they have a process where we just submit an application. But most times I'm usually going in front of a select board or a committee as a result of a potential increase. So those are more or less just some comments that I wanted to add to this the discussion. Great, thank you. I do not see any other members of the public with their hands up. Um, Dan, do you have your hands still up, or is that just a holdover? I'm good, thank you. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so where where are we? Do we have a motion? Or, Donna, I was trying to carve what you were saying into as close to motion form as possible. So you're up. Oh. Yeah. Having watched this for a number of years and watched the, the council struggle with making, you know, using a lot of time in council meetings to decide what goes on the ballot and what doesn't, especially during budget time. You know, one, one way to look at this, and again, it's up to you, but the, the, this is a, a problem of two agencies. I mean, everyone else, I mean, really, we've got Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice, who is a necessary but who, who went through the the community fund process decided um it it didn't you know it didn't get funded enough so chose to petition has continually been successful and and then understandably with the, the covid years the council said we'll just put you on the ballot and the Kel Kellogg Hubbard library which is you know a whole different level of funding that's our community library and in fact the council used to go through a whole process of evaluating their budget and finally said you know they're not a city library, they're a public library. Let them just put their, you know, I, and the only control was sort of if they, if they have an increase, they've got it. So, you know, it, it may be that we really just need to figure out how to handle those two agencies. And, you know, maybe it is just making an exception because they're above a certain amount and deciding how much you need, you know, uh, I, again, I'm not advocating or recommending anything, but you could just say, hey, it's the Kellogg Harbor Library, let them put a budget on between them and the voters and for CVHHH maybe they come in and give a presentation and you hear them and decide how much you want to put on and everyone else goes through the community fund 
I, I, you know, I, but, and then, and then the other part of that policy, then if there's somebody new who hasn't been part of the mix, who, who wants to be above the, you know, to, then they've got a petition because they're sort of new to the process. I don't know, I'm just trying to think of ways to keep this simple so that everyone has clear way of knowing how to proceed and we're not sort of creating a whole new system. Bill, that sounds like a motion. I can't make it. <laughs> <laughs> True enough. Um, I still think, though, the community fund shouldn't get those bigger requests. Well, that's your call. Just, that's the only thing I would differ from what you said. Uh -huh. Give them more money. Okay. Um, <laughs> and Mary Kate. Hi, thank you. Uh, Mary Kate Lowman. I am a um, um, Montpelier resident and I am chair of the CDHHH board. So I, I'm, I'm, want to first say I'm very, I, I love the comments that I've heard so far. I think um, in terms of a broader policy, I completely support accountability, um, understanding how our organization is using the money. I think we are happy to tell our story. It's a good story. So I, I would support that. Uh, in terms of policy, I completely agree that it needs to be a transparent, consistent policy across organizations because I think that's fair for us and for anyone else who may be coming down. So I, I like those comments around, you know, above a certain threshold, that's where we talk to the council and get it direct to the ballot. Um, I agree that the petition can be a significant barrier, especially given the recent times. Um, and in the healthcare sector, it's like workforce and the people who are working at CVHH who are often the ones that are gonna be out there collecting signatures, they are they are still strapped. Yes, we're moving past that bolus of the, the pandemic, but like finding nurses, finding staff, finding anyone to fill these positions, it's a real, it's a real burden. Um, so I just wanna flag that as a specific practical hurdle for this year, but I think in, in coming years, um, the petition, uh, does present a burden, at least at the level, especially at the level that it is right now. Um, so those are my comments. Um, I, I would just support transparency. I support consistent policy. Um, and for those organizations that do have higher amounts, I don't think it's fair to the, um, I'm blanking on that, the, the, the commission um, that yeah. sees projects. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Um, I think they they supporting that money for smaller projects and smaller assets is, is is fair. So those are my comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Palin. And Palin. If we uh, put these two agencies on a policy or written document, is it um, okay to name them? Right. We we talk about like oh library should go, which means that we will put the library name on the document, right? So is it okay so to do this? I would say, again, non-voting yeah. member here. Yep. <laughs> you know, the library funding is so out of, you know, the, the library is more than all of this, the rest of this put together. I mean, it's its, its own thing. It's our public library, I, I think. Simple, you know, you could almost say we're going to have a policy for the library and this policy for everybody else. And so the policy might be okay, the library just gets to put, you know, they come in and make a budget presentation, they get to put their, their thing on the ballot because they're our public library and that's how they work. Um, you know, I think the one control the council had tried to have over the years was understanding the proportion of Montpelier funding versus neighboring town funding versus, you know, compared to usership. Are we paying a disproportionate share? And I, you know, you do lose that if you don't see those that information. So, I think maybe having a a discussion with the council before the council puts the article on the ballot might be a good way because then you can at least have some control. If you don't like it, you put them on. Um, and then, you know, with regard to the other one, the Central Vermont Home Health, maybe you could have a policy that says, you know. If you originally petitioned and you've been supported, you know, five years in a row with approval rates of above 75, you, know, you create a criteria, so it wouldn't be just named for them, but which at least now they're the only people that need it. But if somebody else does, then it would be. The same. Yeah, I mean, I again, would, just think it out loud. 
Yeah. Yeah, I was re uh, just asking that. So great clarification. Thank you. Uh -huh. So instead of naming specific organization, we can create more general policy, so we can use it for different organizations in the future. Thank you. Okay, let me come at this a different way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is is there consensus on the council with the parameters of the policy as uh, as the city manager <laughs> laid, just laid out? I, I'm no. Okay. I'm not clear enough on what that is to be able to just. I, I need a motion and discussion on a motion and and. Well, let me tell it's you. It's not what, clear enough for me. The <laughs> next the next step of my comment would be to say. If we're pretty, if you're basically with Bill on this, ask him to come to us with a policy written out that we would then adopt or not or modify. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's been a lot of ideas tossed out, and I'm not at all clear on what we would be directing. I mean, if if I could if I could hear it spelled out really clearly, then I could react better to it. But I can't right now. So if I were making a motion, which I can't, I would say keep the, the recommendations you already agreed to about the community fund and mm -hmm. having them come in to request funding early. Keep all those in place. So you already decided that on June 28th. Mm -hmm. Personally, I would at least set the amount of arts funding in the community fund. But that's up to you. And then I would say, so separate motion. This would be a series of motions to, rather than trying to do one thing. I would say ask the Keller, you know, the Keller Club lever to, to present a budget in budget time, and the council will place their article on the ballot. And I don't know if we create a situation. So I think the, the gray area there is that we're creating a situation we don't like their, their budget. Do we not put it on the ballot? This council might be fine. So you might want to decide what you want to say about that. And then the last part would be to say, if you, so another motion might be, if you are a nonprofit agency that is above $20,000, which I think goes beyond, I don't think the community fund funds anybody above 20, um, Not this year. and have been successful on the ballot for at least five consecutive years with an approval rate of 75% or more, you can go on without a petition. Or three years, or two years, whatever, one year, whatever. But, so there would be a series of steps by which they wouldn't all be necessarily one motion. Yeah, that, that sounds reasonable. One ballot for two years. I just watched the council spend yes. Yes. hours at yeah, budget yes. time over this when they've got more important things to be talked. Not that these aren't important agencies, but it becomes a process question, not a content question. Yep. Carrie. And I just want to throw in that I think the point um, made about accountability and, and transparency of what's done with the money, uh, in particular when we're when we are asking nonprofit agencies to basically perform services on behalf of the city, I think is a really important one. And I so I'd love to not let that go. And I, I'm not really sure what the answer to that is, but I'd like to build that in somehow. If you get money from the city, there are certain expectations about transparency about your work and how the money is spent. So the current policy does require them to provide a report for what they did with the money. Um, it might be worth a conversation with um, the, the community fund board. One of the, the issues that has been wrestled with that, to that point over the end, is that some of these grant awards are for very small sums of money, $500, $1,000, and how much work is required to, you know, now, maybe it's just giving us their annual report or something like that. You know, I think we could find something, but for, for the, you know, I mean, the library is always very transparent anyway. CVHHH is always very transparent with their, you know, but they have bigger staffs to do that. Some of the, some of the smaller people really is a one, you know, so I think that's been the, the tension is how much information are we asking for for a relatively small contribution? Now, some of them are $7,500, and that's a little different, and, or 10000 and I'm sure both the library and uh, home health have an annual audit, yes. which we could, which we could make them give us if we want, if we wanted to. Donna. Yeah, but the irony is, 
the Montpelier Community Fund has a terrific standard and everybody adheres to their data of who they serve, how many are Montpelier residents, ages, I mean they ask a lot and everyone does it. But it's the bigger ones we really don't get as as much data from. So I think that would be a really good point that we have them in at some point and look at their annual report, that would be good. But way ahead of our budget. We've got to, if you're going to have any kind of change in letting them go on the ballot, we need to make that decision early. And I feel like this happened because Central Vermont Home Health reached out to me and said, do we have to collect signatures? <laughs> I said, wow, this is really late to make this decision. Um, okay, so I'd like to get to an end point of this conversation. Donna, or Lauren, sorry. I mean, I, I like the um, motion Bill was suggesting. The, the piece I'm wrestling with still is, is it like if the budget is more than inflation or, or like, like set 10% or something, I'm just like, you know, the Dan could be really visionary with a library and be like, I want to have a $500,000 budget and we're going to create a new tech center. And like if we, I want to have some ability, like that would have huge implications. That might be a great idea and the voters might love it, but it would have huge tax implications also. And so like, how do we intersect with that? Like, I don't want to just give like carte blanche necessarily, like given that it affects tax rates, but like, but I want to also make it easy for them and to not have to do petitions like almost ever hopefully <laughs> um, and I'm fine with Central Vermont hope, like having a policy that acknowledges these two entities and that the work they've done previously and the successful like um, votes they've received which is like what the language bill had suggested but like I'm just like wrestling with how how would we weigh the library comes in they want a 15% increase are we like where what line or even just for guidance for them of like where would we be really scrutinizing versus just rubber stamping. Which I'm not sure. I'd like to make a motion, and I support it, that yes. to this year we indeed put the library and Central Vermont Home Health on the ballot without petitions. And that we make a policy through what Bill's working on and he brings it back to us and we vote on it next meeting. Because I think there's ideas here, but it's not, as, as Carrie was saying, it's not written out yet. It's but I good. would like to give the library and Central Vermont Home Health a clear direction today, not in October. It gets too late. Would you be willing to add to that, that put it on the ballot with the same budget request as? As they had last year. Right. Absolutely. Yes, that should be in there. That I would, we would put Central Vermont Home Health and the library on the ballot with the same amount as they had last year. Good point. Carrie. Yeah, I don't think we need a motion to do that. I think that's our current policy. Is that right? That's how I read our current yeah. policy. So I think okay. it's just a not, it's not a change. I don't know. They've had to ask every year because the pandemic. Well, they've asked for additional money. If they ask no, for they more, haven't. then. The library policy yeah. was clear that, that if they didn't ask for more money, I think CBHH was a little less clear. Um, that's but but that's what we've done increases. the last three years with them. Yes. Uh, so that's my motion. Technically, they were supposed to petition if they weren't in the community fund because it was, I think the whole goal was to have people use the community fund. And so if, you, if it became easy to get on the ballot without using the community fund, then just do the end around. But I think in this case, they had a pretty good reason. They, their, their money would take up such a large chunk of the community fund. And they've demonstrated the support through regular petitioning. And um, so, uh, you know. So, anyway, so that's, that's Donna's motion anyway. Is there a second to Donna's motion? Second just for purposes okay. of conversation? Okay, so, yeah. yeah. Okay, Carrie. I, we've got a, a note from you. Yeah, no, I think you're right. It says 2013 to 2020. Council established a policy whereby CVHHH and KHL would be placed on the ballot if they had no increase and would petition for their full amounts if they had an increase. And then 2021 to 2023, the Community Fund Process Continued Council made an exception to the petition requirements for CVHHH and KHL due to COVID-19 as noted earlier. You are correct. Sorry. I, I was, I aired, you are right. They have felt the need to come back to us every year um, because it has not been, 
restated to them. And Dan Grober. Thank you for having me again. Um, in the current inflationary environment, we will need to be requesting an increase um, from the city taxpayers. So if the um, motion is for us to need to petition, if we're requesting an increase, I just want to make it clear that that's that you would be, in fact, requesting that we go ahead and petition. Um, we recently signed a new union contract with our employees that has significant wage increases, um, especially in this year one that we're looking at, um, and uh, you know across the board um, inflationary pressure. So we intend to ask for an increase. Um, so uh, I, we would certainly love it if we did not need to petition. Um, I just want to make it clear that if that's the motion of the council that we would need to petition. Well, we're kind of stuck here. Uh, uh, we have we have Donna's motion before us. Is there any other discussion of Donna's motion? Gary's okay. right. We don't need it. Well, we've got a motion before us, so <laughs> so we can. Uh, yes, I, mean, I guess I would rather in the in the write-up that bill's going to do to try to bring some clarity to this like i would be comfortable personally like setting some percentage increase that would would also be not require a um at least for the library specifically maybe cbh we view differently did i say enough ages but um the i i think that's reasonable that they're like inflation or some amount like i no, no, no. This is our community library, but so I don't know if there's some way to to write that in. I think maybe we see if we can get some good thinking when we're not churning so much. Well, there, well, I don't know if other people support that idea or if they would just like to require petitions if it's above the current, the previous ask. One thing we could do is have someone move to amend Donna's motion to say, the same as previous year or the same as previous year plus 10 percent or something like that we we don't know what uh what the request is likely to be from uh kellogg covered yeah go ahead it feels like a slippery slope i, I don't think he, just applying these percentages like the city did it last year with some things in the last year's budget and look at the increases that came out of it unfortunately i, I feel for what dan's going through but He's got to look at what we're all going through and what this budget's going to be. I because I, I think if you put a ten percent or some arbitrary number on it, it's going to be that every year. I mean, they'll have the opportunity to. You're institutionalizing. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't support that. Okay. Is the language of the petition specified? I mean, does the increase, if it's an increase, does the increase need to be called it's out? So I was wondering if the language of the petition is specific about a, a, about an increase for example it has yes. to list a specific amount it has to list a specific yeah amount. Okay. but in relation to the previous amount in other words you have to oh, list yeah. the increase well, no it would just be relation just amount. Yeah. An amount. Total just amount. amount. it doesn't have to reference the previous petition or previous mm -hmm. budget. shall the voters of the city of montpelier appropriate Two hundred thousand yeah, dollars. See that Andy. that's not good enough for me. I mean, I would want. I would want to know: Is this more? Is it less? Is it twice as much? Is it? You know, I mean, it has an effect on the overall expenditure. Uh -huh. There's just not enough information there. Gary. So what we're trying to accomplish here is to be able to um, provide a certain amount of funding, whatever that is, to community organizations for various reasons, which I think is great. And the community fund is a way for us to, to do that while maintaining as much control over our budget as we can. So we say we have this much money that we know is going to go to these community organizations. And we the council doesn't get into deciding exactly how much goes to who. We have good guidelines. We have a process that's working well. Yes. 
Um, so we have, I think we have a problem because we have these two that ha we've made exceptions for over the years. And I think and just in my view, um, I've always, it, the library feels like a, a city function, even if it's not technically part of, you know, a city department, but I think it makes sense to treat that one separately and to, and to build it into our own budget process so that we know how much it's going to be. So we need some kind of system where we know how much money the library is asking for. And then in our budget development process, we're, we're working that in so that it may appear separately on the budget, I mean, on the uh, ballot, but we've made a plan for it in our budget. Because the, the, one of the problems of the ballot process is that anybody could put anything on there mm -hmm. is probably going to pass. <laughs> And so then we don't have the opportunity to build a budget that where we know everything that's going to be in there. So we could, if we, if we feel like there's not enough money going to community organizations, we could up what goes to the community fund and ask Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice to go through that. Or the council in the past decided that that also needed to be treated separately, just like the library. So we could continue with that, but it has to come into our process in a way so that our budget is built with it in mind and not treat it like this separate add-on. So I think we could keep the current policy that we have, but be if we need clarity about the timing of it, and we could also amend the policy so that they don't have to, the library doesn't have to stay level funded, which is not a reasonable expectation, right? Nothing's level funded. But so that we're not gonna say, because I agree with Tim, if we say you get a 10% increase and they're gonna get a 10% increase every year, which may or may not be appropriate. But so if we can build it into our process, so we know this is how much the library needs, and then we look at it in the context for our whole thing, we decide, okay, yes. Um, oh, I'm please. sorry, okay, I'm done. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll stop. I'm just rambling now. I didn't catch the last sentence. Yeah. It's still there. So the motion is kind of relevant because we already have the policy. So can I? It's just confirming it because they literally, I mean, community home health has come every year to ask because they have not felt like we had a policy. Because they're asking for more. No, they have not asked for more. That was a mistake in Bill's thing. They had not asked for more. Oh. But anyway, so do you want to withdraw the motion or do you want to just vote on the motion and I can withdraw the motion? That's fine. Okay. 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 Well, so, so the home health is now part of the policy that's in place does not need signatures. That's what we're saying. Thanks. Thanks. For the same amount. Yes. That's okay. correct. Great. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I'm just trying to make sure I, I'm clear and library is clear. And so, so, because I, I like I like the idea. I'm just to make sure. So they would submit their budget to us the same time mm -hmm. everybody else puts their budget in. We'd know what they were asking for. And then usually that happens. We usually have some idea of what they're early in the process, what they're asked, whether it's a petition or whatever. So we do figure that into our overall planning. We list it right, there. We list it. We list it right in the budget book. Yeah. Um, I think the question comes at what point do we, like we, I mean you, that the council seek to exercise some discretion over their budget by what you choose on to put on the ballot. And mm. what alternative do they have if they really don't like the choice that you make for what you're gonna put on you? Do they have to go petition just for the difference? Do they have to, you know, right? Because, so I think that's the, the tension is how, mm -hmm. do, how do you, you know, um, you know, how do you manage that? You know, we have an agreement with the cemetery commission how that works. So they they you know they agree to be part of our budget process and they go in the city's budget and they agree not to petition or put a separate ballot item. So that's how that's how that works. You know, the library and probably CBHH wouldn't necessarily want that they get higher approvals than we do. So you know they, they don't necessarily want to be protected by the city budget necessarily. They want they like standing on their own. So I you know I, it is a tough nut crack really and sure but i can also understand not just saying you know nobody that's here now was involved with that but you know if you look at the history um 
you know, in 2006, they they had a 99,000 budget and brought in a $96,000 increase to a $99,000, you know, 100% increase. And it passed. <laughs> but, um, but do we want to tell them now, if you come in with a 100% increase, we'll just put it put you on the ballot. Or they've got, they're looking at a collect, new collective bargaining agreement. We want a 40% increase. Um, is it guaranteed that that's going to go on the budget? No. And so how do we handle that? We could tell them. Well, they, they've Dan's been listening to this whole conversation. Maybe he has a suggestion for what would work best for them. Well, just to be clear, we're not requesting a 40% increase. Uh, <laughs> I didn't think you were. <laughs> Uh, it would be lovely and it would probably pass, but we're not requesting it. Um, the, I understand the balancing act that you're struggling with. Um, we'd be happy to make a presentation to the council as we have in years past. Um, it just seems, um, we would certainly collect all the petitions that would signatures that we needed where we asked to petition. It would just be a distraction and a lot of time and effort that went into a process that's really probably unnecessary in my opinion. So my preference would be to make a request to the council, but I understand also that depending on when the timeline of when that happens, that if you said, no, we don't like your increase that we would then He's scrambling to petition in time to meet the deadline. So, you know, it may be that this conversation is happening too late this year, um, but we could make relatively early requests in future years so that there would still be time. I know, for instance, we have to, Worcester is our earliest town that we work with that's requesting um, by October 13th, I believe. So we, we will have our municipal requests approved by the board by that date um, and and would plan to petition shortly after that. I you know if if you wanted to have me at the next council meeting for a presentation or something that would probably be an adequate amount of time. But if it's not going to be until December or something like that, and then there's the possibility that the council says, no, we don't like that, that's problematic. Or. I had an idea. Um, what if we had a policy for the library that um, the practice is for the library to present their budget and council may request that an amount above previous funding levels um, require a petition with a, with a timeline that gives them time to do it? I mean, that way we can use discretion. Is it in or out of line with inflation and the kind of the increase that the city budget overall? Um, but it doesn't lock in a certain percentage. It just gives the current council discretion to require an above and beyond current funding levels or if it's increasing more than the city budget that year or something. Um, I, yeah, keeping in mind, uh, one of our items on the agenda later tonight is uh, the uh, scheduling for, uh, for meetings. The first budget presentation is scheduled for December 13th. Um, I'm sure Dan wants to be in here making a presentation way before that, so that if they need to accept, need to collect signatures, they want to do it before the ground is covered with snow. Tim. I guess I appreciate it, but in reality, the budget process is driving our essential services police, fire, ambulance, water, mm -hmm. sewer, public works, all essential services in this community that we're trying to fund. Library is, a, is, is an essential piece of the community, but it's not on that top list of really services. So I'm kind of having a hard time bumping this ahead of those in a process. I think in fairness, we have a process. It's known when it starts. So maybe you got to walk around in the snow and get your petition signed if they don't like the number we hopefully don't agree to apparently. Um, but I don't see a better solution right now. I, I don't think we're going to be able to tell them in October 
or if we do, either it's not fair to our other agencies and departments. Carrie. Yeah, I think Dina's probably right about the, the timing um, for this year, at any rate. Uh, but I do just want to disagree about the library being an essential service. I think a library is an essential service for a municipality, but that's just a difference of opinion, but I just wanted to register that. <laughs> Donna. Well, and and as much as I've been through a lot of city council budgets, things go on the budget on the ballot, they get voted on, and then we have to readjust. And the library has never gone down, not once. <laughs> so it, it seems like you need to accept it. And the interesting thing about the library, way back when, when we used to actually get data, Montpelier wasn't in the same proportion of users as you were money, but that's because we value it. It's a real central. It brings people into Montpelier. It does more than just serve the readers. And that's what the data in some of these places doesn't show. So I, I don't want to spend any more time on this. <laughs> yeah, I'm in agreement. I, I feel like we've spent an awful lot of time on this. And I'm not sure that we're any closer to a resolution. <laughs> Dan come in next time. <laughs> and, and do what? And make his presentation? Yeah, and then we can swallow it. I mean, then we'll know what the number is, at least. We'll know what the number he's asking for, and we could have a vote to put it on the ballot, mm -hmm. and it might or might not pass. Yep. And it could be that... Uh, Maybe the alternative here, because I, I was about to say, decided I'd said enough. So, uh, but but that you know, if you set a number for, I mean, basically to the point that Tim made, that you know, you all and I will hear it. If let's say we say, okay, it's ten percent. Well, it's not any department heads here left, but they're all going to come in and say, where's my ten percent? Right? Yeah. You know, how come they just gave that away, and you know, we're going to get put through the ringer? So I, maybe it's just an either or that says. You can come in through our budget process, knowing our timing, and we'll go through and we'll consider your budget and we'll place a, re a reasonable amount on the ballot as that we determine, or you can petition and you can start your petition anytime you want. And leave it up to the library, which they way they want to go. And um, because, you know, as I'm listening to this and thinking about it, you know, we either have to make a decision about their amount so early that we're not, you know, we have a, we won't even be giving you our preliminary, like what happens if we just do the same thing this year, next year? You know, what is that, the rough cut that you get? You won't, won't even have that at your next meeting. We'll, we'll be trying to figure out how to cut this year's budget, much less, you know, yeah. Yeah. next year. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I, I, I I don't know what else to say. And as far as CVH, each go probably keep the same if you're if it's the same amount. You have plenty to keep the same. Amount. Then you go on the ballot. If you don't, you know. Well, Sorry, Dan. So basically, we've done nothing. It's really what we're already. That's what we're already doing, right? So we have a policy in place. Yeah, there yeah. we are. Okay. Okay. I don't want to talk about this anymore unless someone <laughs> has a concrete proposal to to fix it. So I'm just going to say this out loud, partly for Dan and for CVHHS and just for all of us so we're clear. So our policy is state, if you want to be on the ballot and you are keeping the same amount, we'll put you on the ballot, no questions asked. Yep. If you want to have an increase, you can either petition or you can submit through our process and you take what you get at the end of the process, but you don't have to petition. And maybe... You, none of you said this, but maybe the promise would be at least we wouldn't reduce it. <laughs> we won't reduce it. <laughs> well, I mean, I, yeah. I mean, then then people can make their choice which way they want to go. They've got three options. Yeah, I think that's right because un, un, until we change the charter, they always have the right to yes. whatever dollar amount they want. They always have the right to uh, petition. to petition, petition. for yep. right. something, and that's you know. Yeah. That is 
but you know, throughout municipal government all through Vermont, it is a you know, it's a thing. I mean, I, I don't know. I suppose we could take that away through charter change, but I doubt people would support that. <laughs> yeah, that's, a that's a tough one. Yeah. No, you know what I mean. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying we should, but I mean, there's there's always that option for. I do want to say qualified agencies. You can't just come in and get money for your private business. There are certain legal things that money can be appropriated for. So it's not anybody can ask for anything. But within this, the, the bounds of things that are legally appropriatable, um, anyone can petition as long as they get the, the qualified signatures. And there's nothing we can do about that. Yep. OK. Let's move to the next item. Thank you, Bill. Let's the, clar the clarity helps. Um, Evelyn, item 13, communications update. Can you enable screen share? Thank you. Hey folks, um, I'm Evelyn Prim, the communications coordinator for the city. I will keep this uh, fairly brief um, because there is a ton of information that's included in the packet that you can review on your own time. Um, so I just wanted to, to mainly just share um, a follow-up on um, our conversation from a, a few meetings ago where we talked about um, some of the things that we learned um, post-flood uh, communications related. Um, and so I just wanted to share all with you all um, some of the things that I'm working on right now. Um, and uh, and where we're going to go into the future. So it looks like it's a little. You can see it. It's good enough. All right. All right. Um, so just a really brief overview. Um, so the city uh, administration has recently done the uh, flood after action. So I'm basically modeling a, the communications after action after that process. So kind of what. Um, what happened, what did we learn, and what are we going to um, do to improve for, for next time. Um, so I'm going to run through a few of the different data collection methods that I used to analyze this um, and the methods there, and the, that we'll dive into the just a brief recap of some of the results, um, what, we're getting, what worked well, where can we improve, um, and then the things that I'm doing now. Um, so a few, the few of the key points on the uh, right-hand side are just some of the, uh, the areas that were brought up during the our conversation a couple uh, council meetings ago. The, the top one is, is kind of the, the big one for me. Um, so for, for about half of you uh, that were here for my uh, very first presentation to the council last October, um, I talked a lot about research and how um, this position being very new to the city is a great opportunity to really make sure that um, we are living up to the uh, communications related functions of our strategic plan. Um, and so a lot of my work Yes, it's putting out information, but it's also evaluating what we're doing um, on an incremental basis, and it is an iterative process, so we're constantly um, looking for ways to improve. So I just wanted to, to, to point that out. Um, and so one of the big uh, developments in recent months that was a really uh, beneficial part of our flood response was the development of the crisis communications response team. So this is essentially just a collection of the people who are already doing the majority of the communications functions. Uh, so our current members are uh, myself, uh, Mary Smith, Jasmine Benson from Public Works, uh, Matt Wilson in the Community Services Department, Jake Larrabee from Fire and EMS, and uh, Mike Philbrook from MPD. Um, and we are recently uh, going to be adding in uh, Sarah McMillan from the clerk's office. So we'll have basically all the, the public-facing departments represented in our group. So we have a really diverse 
uh, array of not only skill sets, but different populations that we are all serving. So essentially what this crisis communication and response team is, is just it's an organization of our uh, the, the members. So then we created a plan to follow in the event of an emergency. And thankfully, we were able to uh, troubleshoot this uh, quite a few months ahead of the flood. So it really helped us um, to be able to hit the ground running on um, that basically that Monday morning. Um, and the, so the plan is included in the packet. Um, and so basically what we do is we could just coordinate and manage the distribution of uh, different public communication functions um, in the city during an emergency. And um, basically, so in, at, in, during the flood, we uh, functioned as public information officers to both uh, residents and the community and also city staff. So as, um, as you are all aware, um, a lot of us were really displaced during the flood. Um, some of us were still at home, some of us were basically trapped in our offices. Um, and so this, uh, it was helpful to have this team as both a relay between the city and the public and also be between city staff to make sure that we were all um, getting the most recent and up-to-date information as possible. Um, so a little bit about what went into the after action. So the different data collection methods that uh, we focused on, and also let me back up and just say, so the after action was an activity of the crisis communication response team um, that was led primarily by me just as the organiz organizer of the group. Um, but we all had a chance to uh, review the different um, methods and add to the final product. Uh, so we, the city conducted a flood feedback survey in August. Um, it was open from the first day of August uh, right to the, to the 31st, and we received 118 responses to that. The full breakdown of responses is included in the, in the packet. Um, we asked three main questions, um, basically how, how you were affected by the flood, uh, so to what degree did, of flood damage did you receive and um, what worked well communications-wise from the city and what would be an opportunity for improvement. Um, we did get um, some pretty passionate responses, so I, I encourage you all to, to look at those. Um, and we just get some really uh, good constructive feedback. Um, so that all went into this, this process. Um, and then also the recovery and res resiliency forums, which I've, I've shown in a couple of these pictures. Those were huge for uh, communications. Um, learning and also a, a new term that uh, I've, I've noticed kind of floating around is instead of feedback, um, feed forward has been um, mentioned. And I, I don't know how I feel about that yet, but I do. I like the sentiment behind it. So uh, kind of just taking that into into consideration. Optimism. Like, exactly. <laughs> Future oriented. Um, and then, so we're all we're constantly receiving um, comments and uh, questions on social media. So uh, between Mary and myself, um, on the city's page, we, we look at those and we make sure that um, everyone who uh, who reaches out to us gets a response on those pages. And then the same thing for DPWs and PDs page as well. Those are all very really active on social media. Um, and so we receive a lot of communication from there. Um, and then also during the flood, a a tremendous amount of just personal correspondence, where it be people emailing members of the uh, the CCRT um, and myself during these last couple of days. Um, so it's we're really seeing a trend in people identifying ways to connect with the city by having the uh, basically identified um, individual staff members who are the 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 PIOs basically for the city. Um, and so between all of us, uh, there's usually Every hour of the day is covered. So if there's a, a question that comes up, we, we usually have it have it covered relatively soon. Um, and so this graph shows, so in the flood feedback, basically the survey question number two, what worked well? Out, these data points represent a percentage of the total responses. So for instance, 24% um, of the 118 people ranked Facebook as their uh, the number one thing that worked well. Um, so the big ones here, kind of no surprise. Uh, so Facebook and social media was was rated really well. Um, Front Porch Forum was also ranked uh, that it worked well. Um, VT Alerts, we were using that quite often throughout the flood. And then um, Montpelier Alive as well. Um, and then so the other ones, just to, to, to provide the context that the other ones that have like just 2% or 1%, it, it's not the intention to draw from this graph that those, that those aren't 
um, working well. It's just that those are just the percentage of the 118 people that responded. So that's not a, a great um, number for survey responses out of a total population of 8,000. But um, you know, it's it's it was an opt-in sort of survey, so it, it wasn't um, one of the uh, larger survey uh, activities that the city has gone through. So this is just more anecdotal. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Did you work? Facebook and front porch form or only one? Uh, so those are separate. So the so Facebook, uh, you could mark. You could mark I wondered, more than one, yes. When you look at the social media, you've got like 47% of the two together. Oh, yes. I just wondered how many were the same people. Correct. Yeah, so these numbers represent the, the number one thing that people were people rated as their. So I wasn't double counting. OK, in cool. The, yes. cool. Thank you. Of course. Um, and then, so the uh, basically this, the summary of results. Or did I skip one? No, I didn't. It's coming up. Um, so the summary of the the results was a little more difficult to code. It took a little bit more time. Um, but the what it boiled down to is basically eight themes of uh, of areas for improvement. So the big ones here are listed there, and they're also represented um, in this graph here in the white bubbles. Um, so the uh, the white bubbles are those eight themes. And then branching off from those are the individual action items that uh, myself and the uh, CCRT is working on and the city is just working on to, to expand. Um, and so we those are detailed. Um, not every single um, point is detailed in the report that's in the council packet. Um, but it uh, some of them can be uh, somewhat combined. And that's what the. Uh, gold arrows linking the two represent just relationships between the different um, the different areas. So for instance, uh, like including um, city branding in communications and then uh, creating a direct and email text uh, notification system that obviously has a really strong relationship. So that could be considered as one um, sort of one action item. Um, and then so the big action items that I'm working on right now are, uh, so we already have a we have a direct communication um, via email using the notify me email updates on the website. So these we have been sending out the city manager's uh, weekly report, the uh, the summary of notify or the, the summary of uh, updates from city council meetings that we just started doing, um, and I, and one went out today uh, from. Uh, sharing updates from the uh, from the PD and DPW, so just more of an all-purpose uh, way to connect to people. Um, this is uh, again one of the the items that was ranked pretty heavily as as that was a desire from the community. They wanted a, di a direct way to re to get uh, updates, uh, which I will also say is is different than when I first began. Um, working here, so it was. It's interesting to see how the different communication needs change um, over time, um, and it's also um, improving um, VT alert messages. So a lot of the messages that we sent out from uh, VT alerts didn't explicitly say that they were coming from the city of Montpelier. So that was just an opportunity um, to show people that you know the city was behind a lot of the uh, uh, communications that were going on, but we just didn't make it explicitly clear. So. Do we have our own in-house text uh, uh, blast uh, system, too, in addition to the VT alert? Um, yes, we do. I know DPW does when they send out, um, like, uh, boil water notices and things like that. So yes. Yep. And how many people, do you have a guess of how many people are signed up for those? I don't, but I can ask Jasmine and get that, too. She'll know. She's the one who manages that system. Because obviously, we can only send them out to people who request them, same with the emails. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then, uh, so kind of on that same note, just making disaster preparedness plans more visible and accessible. So on the website, under the, uh, so you have the top uh, five mega menus in the how do I section. Um, we are currently building out a resource page that links to all the different um, community resources. So for instance, like the Vermont Department of Health page, uh, a VTRANS page, Vermont Emergency Management. Those will all be uh, on that page in one place so people don't have to search when they want to find something. It's the, the, the 
every basically every type of resource that we can identify will add a link on that page so people can go to it and it'll be organized by category so if you're looking for food assistance you know to go here um, or if you're looking for emergency um, uh, like emergency shelters or housing you can go to that section um, and then so another thing that was mentioned quite a bit and this is uh, this was discussed in our, our la the last time we had kind of had this conversation about communication uh, was creating more how-to uh, information. And so the uh, welcome to Montpelier packet of information is uh, is in the works. And so we're going to be basically, that'll be a text document and a physical copy if people would, if people prefer, that basically has everything spelled out um, for the, the major functions of the city. Uh, so it's, it's fewer, arrived in Montpelier and you had no idea where to where I where do I pay my taxes uh, you know how do I catch the bus things like that um, that will go into that um, and then we're also going to continue on doing different um, website show and tells that really uh, show how to use the different features on our website um, since we had just invested um, a lot into the website redesign so really just making sure people are able to utilize the services that are already uh, that are the city is already working on. Um, and then the, the newest uh, addition to some of the dish, uh, diff, some, some of the uh, project uh, portals that we're, uh, we're working on are different ways that people can engage is the, uh, the Zen City community uh, project portal. So uh, this is also another way for us to engage with community members and um, they can reach out to us. So for instance, um, if you go to the page, and this is linked right to our uh, homepage on the website, and you go into the Minute in Montpelier podcast, you, you can suggest uh, topics for our next uh, podcast episode. Um, and so just a, a sneak peek teaser, we're gonna be uh, speaking with um, Deputy Chief uh, Kevin Moulton and uh, Sergeant Mike Philbrick tomorrow um, for a, a, a PD uh, episode, flavored episode of the podcast. So that'll be coming out shortly. Um, and so that is basically all I have to present, and I uh, welcome questions. Thanks. Thanks. Any questions? I have a comment, which is that it seems like we're, we've really ramped up our communications function, and I think that's a really good thing. Yes, we sure have. You know, people you. need to be able to hear what, the, what their city government is doing. Definitely. Any questions? Go ahead. So is there, and maybe I missed it when I read it through, but also a flow of the hardware to back up so you all can connect? Is that yes, in the there vision? Is. Yep. So the, the plan is, a, so it's an internal document, so we, obviously because it has people's um, personal contact info. So the the plan for, uh, we've talked about the I'm same thing. I was thinking thing, about, you know, when you didn't have a phone, yes. there you were. Oh, yes. And, and why you went to Facebook first because you couldn't get anywhere else. I mean, just, so that was, yes. to me was like a hardware connection. Like you didn't have internet or you don't have a telephone. What, what, what do you do? Yes, so that is actually going to be one of the improvements that we make to our the crisis communication response plan in um, it just spelling out all the different ways to connect to, for employees to connect with them, employees during those different ways uh, or during a, any type of an emergency. And that could also be something that we, uh, that can also be an addition that we make to our communications page on the, on our website. Um, so right now on the, so if you go to the city manager's website under the departments tab um, and then you click on communications, it shows, it's a list of everything, all the different ways that you can either receive updates or share information or get information from the city. So it's a, it's a pretty comprehensive page that, um, and that we're constantly adding to as well as we develop new ways. So do you see a piece of this, and maybe it's, it's not the appropriate place, but several residents on State Street, District 1, that was flooded and couldn't get out yeah. and, hadn't, and their electricity was off, felt totally isolated. They really wanted to see a staff member come down in a boat and say, are you all right? I mean, is it going to go to that fine level of communication that sometimes we don't have all this electronic stuff? We don't have a telephone. Yeah, I think that's always the goal. You know, okay. whatever city staff Good. have the capacity to, to do um, is is making sure, especially for most vulnerable during, during, uh, during a crisis, so. Great, yeah. thank you. Of course. Um, this is great. Just wondering about getting 
what the plan is to put this to share this back out I'm thinking of like the people who filled in the survey we have email addresses mm -hmm. the people who signed up at the forums a number of people put their email addresses and putting it out on the channels that people apparently use definitely I assume you're planning to just showing we actually are <laughs> yes trying to learn and improve exactly bridge, great but, yes awesome yep I assumed that just thanks okay everybody happy with this ready to move on Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, everyone. Two percent went to the city website. Two percent. <laughs> we got to work on that. Especially since it looks well, like and according to this, only four percent went to the tech. Already, already yeah. got the okay from <laughs> I mean, like, the boss. It's it's twenty four. It's ten o'clock. Oh, the first do week. That. I mean, because we, we don't want to. And that will only be a week before the actual strategic planning. So you'd be all. Yeah. And you've got the info to read. So. Okay. Good. Can I, uh, on the subject of strategic planning, um, I wanted to ask if there is kind of a, f for our, when we get into st our next process of planning, is there a framework for that discussion or is that in development or, you know, do we? Yeah, um, Paul Costello will be leading it. And yeah. um, I think he sent me a draft, um, which I think he's going to share with the mayor. Basically, I think he's going to review what we've done, but then try to start from scratch, like new group, new flood, you know, what are the big picture, you know, what, what are the top goals, and then what do we need, you know, what do we need to go from it? So I think, it, I mean, a strategic plan is a strategic, right? These are the top things we want to accomplish in big picture, and then how do you, what strategies do you use, and then, so, so the, the structure will probably be similar, but the content will be whatever you folks want to put in. And I think there'll be some of the dots and the you know the whole the whole picking priorities. <laughs> so, uh, and maybe this is not anything anyone else is interested in, but is there any opportunity during the strategic planning to sort of look at our differences within the council members or how we approach things, and whether that's a simple like a disc. You know, something we can do ahead and sort of look at our process and our neighbor's process so we can better understand sometimes where we're coming from that I would like that well I know and we've been trying to schedule that um, a, kind of a work a workshop a retreat that was not content um, yeah. so I did tell Paul that we were trying that it was something we've been trying to do and had not been able to be successful so I, I don't know whether he's gonna try to build some theme of that in our understanding or if there's any at least beginning a conversation uh, but you know it, it's also everything's pushed back a little bit we're coming into budget so we really need do yeah. need to set our priorities but yes i think that would it be important it doesn't have to be at this meeting just somewhere along the line yeah. would be good okay maybe if you nail your priorities in the first hour we can have two hours <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay winter and budget schedules skipping 13 or 14 winter and budget schedule so there's nothing magic to this. I think the one question was whether we were meeting on the 11th, we are meeting on the 18th for the strategic plan and then the regular meeting on the 25th. Otherwise, um, it's pretty straightforward. Every year we run into this that because we're second and fourth, the fourth Wednesday is always the night before Thanksgiving and the fourth uh, in November and the fourth Wednesday in December is always between Christmas and New Year. And we've never really had great desire to meet on either of those dates. Mm -hmm. So you have really just moved everything up uh, a week, which was fine when it was our building. So <laughs> we will have to figure out, um, you know, another place. But typically, and, that, and then I think the other thing was, uh, again, I built in three budget, you know, two budget workshops in January plus a regular meeting to discuss budget. We've dropped those sometimes in the past if we don't, if we reach budget conclusion, but we build the time in if we need it. Uh, and then we would be done um, at the end of January, which is our statutory deadline and printer deadline and ballot deadline and all those other deadlines. Some budget years are easier than others. <laughs> yes, <laughs> this one probably will not be. Uh, exactly. All right, great. But yeah, the sooner we know that you're on board with it, the sooner we can schedule the meetings appropriately and not uh -huh. find alternate places. Okay, so do you want us to give you the thumbs up a now? A motion would be good. Okay. 
there a motion? I move the staff proposed um, November, December, January schedule, winter schedule. Second. And there's a second. Any other discussion? No. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Great. And, and the reason I have a motion just is because they are your meetings. We can't set your schedule, so you're you're setting your own schedule. Yeah. Dictate to us. And that's in the charter. In fact, uh, budgets or meetings are set as determined by the council. Yeah. All right. Other business, Donna. Your. I, I want to say that um, we had some really persistent residents who got my attention and Lauren's, we went and visited their homes, and it is devastating to see the houses that were just totally gutted. And when you hear them talk about it, and you know, all of our homes, we put a lot of ourselves into it. Things that you'll never get back out when you sell it, and things you can't replace once they're all gone. And the level of work these individuals have done to clean out their house, and now they're struggling with that they are so substantially damaged that they have to either be total compliant or demolish their home. And it's, it's been really uh, very heartfelt exposure. It's been really good. And I, I'm going to have a motion under other, other business. Which is where we are. Um, yeah, uh, under other business, I've asked for, I want the council to consider that because these individuals whose houses are been labeled substantially damaged, and this is a term Mike's left. <laughs> this is a term that, that the planning commission, planning department, had to determine under the uh, FEMA rules. And so they went out thinking there were 300 houses that the planning department visited. When they got done, there were 15 they thought that might qualify. Then when they looked at what actual, as repairs went along, more things torn down, they actually ended up with eight officially declared substantially damaged. And two of those, I believe, are buildings, not houses. Most are on State Street and Elm Street. Now, there are two houses in, on State Street that were substantially damaged, but they're historic, so they're not allowed to be labeled substantially damaged. And it's these eight, to actually 10 people I'm concerned about, and they brought to me the desire that we would not apply any late fee because they can't get their abatement appeal into us before it's late. It actually, the uh, John informed me October 2nd is when that bill goes out. And so from that point on, it's late. And Ed Haggett, bless his heart, really stood up for everybody that he didn't feel it was fair that he would be on public record as being delinquent and would have to go to the Board of Civil Authority and ask for those late fees to be eliminated. So he would like the council up front to say, we are not going to have late fees for the first two quarters for these 10 houses. And that's what I'd like a motion on. So they won't be charged late fee. They'll still do an abatement form. They'll still go before the Board of Civil Authority and ask for whatever they want as far as an abatement on the taxes, but they won't be charged a late fee for the first quarter, which is due in October, as well as the second quarter. Second. So that's my motion. Okay. And actually, John worked out the, the wording. Read wording. your wording. OK, so this is I, I think your wording does it all. Well, it also has your wording on it, so hopefully it sounds all cohesive. Uh, move to suspend property tax late fees and penalties for the first two quarters for those housing, houses designated as substantially damaged by the planning department and to historical houses that have the same level of damage but aren't allowed to be labeled as substantially damaged. Yeah, Michael said there was no term for them. They're yeah. historic. And, I didn't know what that meant, but I wrote it down. And it should be property, <laughs> not houses, because yeah. two of them are buildings. Property, OK. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, uh, I, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. It will mean so much to them that we've done this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Donna.
Can I just? It's the least we can do, literally. I'm sorry. It's the least we can do, literally. Oh, it's, yeah. and they're working so hard with all this bureaucracy. It's just yeah. so sad. So right. sad. Yeah, just, just another question, just on this same topic, if that's okay, Jack, mm -hmm. um, that I don't know, I was hoping Mike might still be here, but um, so they're also seeking, like Mike has been working so hard and just echoing, I know Donna said it last time, but they have been so grateful for the communication and the work that Mike's been doing for them. Um, and they are desperate for the grant, like the, I, which I know that the city's been pursuing money so that they can, because now they're required to either tear down, which they have to then pay for themselves, or um, raise their houses. And so Mike has houses. been working yeah. really hard to seek grant funding to help um, the people who have gotten the substantial um, damage declaration. I don't know if there's any update or just wanted to echo no, that no, if no. we can support that, a, a city letter well, or yeah, something. Mike's or, got a no for this year. They're not willing to re what do you call it? Re uh, change the name and change reallocate reallocate thank you funds that exist but to try to hit up the legislators for next year but it's a up to one hundred and eighty thousand dollars per house to get them raised but they can do all this repair and all the other mitigation but if they don't raise them they'll have to demolish them and when you say raise you mean elevate because there's raise and raise. Well, that's the right. term they use. That's the term they use. I've been trying to use my They have to do, they do have to raise or raise. Yep. Raise or raise. Yep. That's what they're yeah. 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 In the meetings I've been at, I've been hearing them say, hearing the word elevate used, but, but whatever, yeah. We know several we know. of these houses had done mitigations from the previous floods. It just wasn't enough. Yeah. Okay. We're Let's on. See if we can get an update for you. Then we pop it in the weekly memo from Mike, just so that you all know where, where that's at. Great. Anything we can do, obviously. Yep. Yeah. All right. City Council reports. Start down, way down at that end. Um, yeah, I'm seeing that um, downtown businesses are opening slowly, and it is nice to receive news that oh, this one is opening this week this one's opening next week so it is nice to see our downtown being um you know like itself again all right uh pass everything's already come up <laughs> yeah i think that okay Sal. um i'm good um, just as we're entering into our budget development and strategic planning process, the Social uh, and Economic Justice Advisory Committee has been talking about how to integrate equity concerns into both the strategic plan and to the budget process. And recently, um, we were all sent a copy of a tool that can be used, to, an equity assessment tool. Yes. Uh, that they developed a couple of years ago. And so I just wanted to kind of, you know, remind everybody that that is in there. Um, I would love for us to consider officially adopting it and um, if, if it seems appropriate, and then also discussing ways to integrate how we consider equity in all of the decisions that we make, not just in the budget process, but in mm -hmm. everything. So I'm just kind of planting that. I don't have a motion or anything right now, but. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I felt that related to this raising the houses and that indeed four of the houses on State Street that need to be raised re represent 10 housing units, 10 housing units. What would we spend to build 10 housing units? So I. I really feel we have to look at the more equity of n not necessarily building new, but trying to keep what we have um, and helping these individuals. And the other thing is for all of us to go downtown, but to also go online. There's some stores not open, but you can buy things, you can order things, and we all have a responsibility not to go to Amazon and to go downtown. And we really, really, they need our 100% support. I mean, I just can't emphasize that enough. They really need us there. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Um, Mayor's report. Uh, I would say I, uh, I attended the uh, Vermont League of Cities and Towns one day of the town fair and, uh, and the annual meeting. 
yesterday as the city's representative. And I will say I was very happy to cast, uh, cast my vote in favor of uh, Bill Fraser as the uh, incoming uh, president of the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Um, Succeeding. He, he tried to vote against that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, um, I missed it. <laughs> yeah. And then I went to a couple of uh, interesting uh, presentations or discussions. There was one on uh, short term rentals, and that was uh, really just a roundtable discussion. Um, I was, one of the things that became, was clear from everyone is that people are concerned about it and feel they need more information. And I think that's kind of how we feel too. And for a while I've been thinking, well, you, the discussion has been, well, is this a big problem in Montpelier or is this just a couple of uh, properties and maybe it's not something we should worry about? And then the other thing that uh, just occurred to me as I was talking to Kelly the other day was, well, there was a time, you know, 40 years or so ago, when uh, business uh, property owners started converting some of their houses to offices. And it probably started out, it was before I, I moved here, but it probably started out with not very many houses. And we could have thought, well, maybe we didn't need, don't need to worry about it. But if we'd had a policy, preventing that before we lost all those houses on uh, Court Street, for instance, mm. that would be housing that we, uh, we still have. And so thinking in advance about what we can do to preserve housing, I think is, is a good thing. Um, there was also a presentation on uh, how to do uh, community economic development, a good couple of good speakers, including the uh, city manager of St. Albans, where they've been very successful at doing some uh, economic development. And the, and the downtown in St. Albans is, uh, is really very impressive compared to what it used to be uh, 10 or 15 years ago. And uh, a couple of presentations about uh, disaster recovery. I also got to spend some uh, time talking to uh, Jesse Baker, who was the former uh, <laughs> assistant city manager here, and, and she's now city manager in South Burlington, and, uh, and Tony Fakos, our former police chief. And so again, I, Donna has said this in years past, if you have the opportunity uh, in future years, it's worth doing. Yeah. City clerk's report. OK. Um. Well, I'm sure you all will agree that if there, there's anything this world needs more of, it's meetings. And, <laughs> and I'm, I'm here for you to do my part. Um, so tomorrow night's meeting uh, should be short, because there's been a lot of rearranging and some dropping out of, of people <laughs> from these appeals, which is making it a little more bottom heavy, but not so much that we have to break out our schedule. But tomorrow should be short because we just now have one large landowner with about a dozen properties that's going to present them collectively and then uh, supposedly waive, which we can do now, the, uh, uh, the inspections. So there'll be a position where you'll have one big presentation and be able to render one big decision then and there, and then we can all go home and call it a wonderful day. And of course, then the next week, Marty's not going to be around, so we can't have a meeting that week. So we get a little bit of a break. It's, it's almost a bummer because I feel like we're getting behind. You know, we could use this time to get done sooner, but it's just not the way it's shaking out this time with some withdrawals and some reschedules. But um, and John, it, speaking of that, if if you could send out an email to all the members of the Board of Civil Authority either tonight or in the morning, just to tell them the only part of that giant binder you have to bring tomorrow night is the ones for uh, down street right yes just bring That's your correct. file don't you don't have to bring the whole binder that, and nope, it's I, probably worth me sending out 
the current version of the schedule, even though I think you all already know it. It'd be nice just to have it. So yeah. I'll send that out too. Great. Um, just a reminder how the quorums and stuff have to work is that there's a quorum to do business, but then the quorum, the folks who can vote who are part of a quorum on any given case have to have witnessed that testimony. So we could have a quorum there of eight people, but then a report comes in and it's a vote on a particular property and only three of those people heard the, uh, um, heard the testimony, there wouldn't be enough there to render a decision. And if four of them had, well, you'd need five, the quorum is eight, then they'd all have to be unanimous, um, which, I, you know, I know folks generally follow the recommendations from, from the, the inspection committee, so that, that's, that's not shocking at all, but just so you all know. And the way around that is if someone is going to be there and participate in a vote, wasn't there for the original testimony, but they can go back and listen to the original testimony. All the audio files are up on the clerk website, which right now is only one, but they're all gonna be going up there for anybody to listen to, so they can, and they can be reviewed at any time then too. Not the highest quality, but you can hear and understand everybody, so. I think that's all I have. Great, thanks. Bill? Um, I have a few things, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so just looking at our schedule, uh, so we'll be meeting in two weeks, the 11th. That's we're doing the zoning public hearing. Looks like we had a couple of things. We'll try to invite the VRC people in if we can get them in at the next meeting. The River Conservancy folks, we can have that conversation. Um, we'll be doing the strategic plan wrap up, and uh, maybe we'll have a presentation on um, budget rescission for this current year. I don't know. Before. I think she was shooting for the 25th. So. Um, I don't know if, if I'll get it. I almost broke her getting the financial reports done so and getting all the FEMA stuff done. So I, I want to be kind. Uh, she's really knocking herself out. Um, we met, I met, well, Kelly and I and Arnie met with the seniors last Friday. Councilmember Brown was there and we all got out alive. That was good. It was an interesting conversation. I think we had um, some good frank feedback. Um, certainly took a, a lot away and tried to share some information and we'll, we'll be trying to figure out ways to move forward. I think their biggest concern, immediate concerns are um, we're still occupying one space, one of the, their, the meeting spaces. We have moved finance out and they'd like to get moving on a, a vacant position. And you know, that's, we're in this hiring freeze position, but at some point, you know, we've got to make decisions about how to move forward. So we're taking a look at that. Um, Council Member Cohen has asked, they, they, through her, had asked to be on one of our future agendas. So we've got that in the pipeline. And uh, again, hopefully we'll be in a situation where we have more positive outcomes to share with them by the time they get here. Um, let's see, should have a proposal out by the end of the week for the city hall design work. That's good. Uh, we should have a proposal in from FEMA about their plans for Country Club Road by the end of this week. Um, that's good. Jack mentioned VLCT um, and then triggered when Carrie mentioned the CJAC work. Uh, I, I guess I knew about this, but uh, heard very specifically that uh, VLCT does an equity cohort. They started it last year. They have eight communities and they're looking to start do it again this year. And it's really intended to look at inside and out the community, most more internally, like how you function and they really, so they're gonna pick eight communities. Uh, they want an elected official, ideally uh, a manager, assistant manager and a, like a staff person. And it's a commitment to a fair amount of meetings. I wanna say five, maybe more. It's, you know, it's with a training, it's Abundant Sun, I think is the training group, but maybe the same people we've contracted with. Um, so I, you might want to give some thought as to sort of whether that's something, I think it's something we, we ought to do. I'm not sure this is good, the year that we have the capacity collectively to do it, but we could give some thought to it and talk about it, maybe get some more information about it for a future meeting. Um, Speaking of VLCT, the mayor did mention that uh, I did become the president of VLCT uh, yeah, Tuesday, yeah, yesterday, and um, taking over from Jesse Baker, who is now the past president. So kept, kept it local, and before that was Moreau Weinberger. So, and, 
had uh, the, the, the big cities represented, and uh, our next new vice president is Marianne Goulet from West Rutland, so a little smaller town. Um, but it's interesting, uh, I just mentioned this, not to pat myself on the but I'm at it. It's kind of an interesting time because this Saturday, I end my three-year term as ICMA vice president for the Northeast. So some of you may not even realize that, but uh, I have been the first person from Vermont since the 90s to represent Vermont, represent the Northeast region on the National International City Managers Association Board. And it's been some time away, and I've really, so I just wanted to say thank you to all the council members for supporting me when I first ran for that and my time commitment for doing that. It's been really fabulous. It's been great to bring Montpelier to the national stage, um, just through name recognition and being at things. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's it's hard to believe that three year term is over, but I'll go literally from that to president of VLCT. And I did check, it was last Montpelier president of VLCT was a guy named Ray Kelly in 1982, council member. So uh, there we go. So thank you for allowing me to serve outside of our community. As always, our city comes first, and I've always put it first, but it is good to learn and bring, um, broaden our, our professional. Uh, so with that, I will be gone. Uh, the ICMA conference starts, well, my, my last board meeting is Friday and Saturday. So, uh, and then the conference starts Saturday. So I'll be leaving tomorrow. Kelly is going down at some point. Um, and it's been a great development tool for her. And we'll be both be back Wednesday. But uh, if there's a real emergency, Sarah uh, LaCroix would be the acting city manager. Um, is she there? She's still here. She's still here, okay. <laughs> She's smiling. She is smiling, I know. I, I, who knows what will happen by the time we come back? We might be down half our employees. I don't know. <laughs> um, but obviously, we're, we're phone calls and emails and texts away. I mean, we'll, it's a working thing. So you know, people should feel free to contact us. We can and we'll send you FaceTime so you can see how it's going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was actually, I was actually concerned we were going to have to have a special meeting while we were gone. I have to do FaceTime. So. Uh, do you guys, yeah, you can do FaceTime anytime you want. I'd be happy to. That's, that's good. I have nothing to hide. Uh, but anyway, so that's my report. Thank you for supporting all of us, supporting me in these uh, external endeavors. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Is there any update from GBA on the rec center report, Don Bachman? So I did meet, yes, thank you. Uh, I meant to have that on. So I did meet with Tom. They have a preliminary draft. Uh, they've got some plans, uh, which they showed, which all look very interesting. They did not have the money aspect put to it yet. So this is from a GBA about the rec center. Um, but I think they are going to be able to address bathrooms. Uh, I think they're going to be able to address the use of the building as a shelter or possible reuse or even as a rec center. You know, they, they kind of, they looked at what can we do immediately to kind of provide public bathrooms? What can we do if we wanted to convert it to a shelter? What can we do if we wanted to have it be rec and shelter? Or one if we wanted to do have some adaptive reuse in the future? So they've evaluated the building structure, the building systems, you know, electrical, HV, all that kind of stuff, the asbestos lines. So they're putting that all together. So we will have this full sort of soup to nuts of, um, which is something I think we really have needed. We've had this building and now we'll have a real complete evaluation of what it will take to do certain things with it. They, is there any timeline? Do they have any idea? He sounded what? like, I mean, the biggest thing was he was actually going to be out of, we, we were trying to coordinate a time when we were both together. Oh, so okay. he, he's, he's gone now, and then I'm going to be gone. So, so, uh, so he showed me the plans, time. and they, they're getting the, the money costs and, okay. um, from the engineers and stuff. So I would imagine it would be soon. Possibly yeah. for the next meeting, or, but yeah. sir, I would okay. bet October. Yeah, no, great. That's good. Yeah. No, they're they're very close to wrapping that up, which I think will be will give us some interesting choice. Whether we have the money for it, I don't know. But at least we'll know. It is our asset, if we want to call it that, and uh, <laughs> so we should know. You know, so I, I was it was good. They've done some good work there. All right. That's all I got. I think we are set, and so we can adjourn at 10:26 p.m. Thank, Thank you all. For trying to talk louder it was much better. Still could improve, but it was much better. <laughs> Still could improve.